You're gonna hunt it down and kill it, aren't you? Sure, we're gonna kill it, aren't we, Joe? You bet, Judge. Consider it already dead. No. No what? We're against killing of any kind. Our work here is important. Someone's polluting these swamps, and it's our job to find out who. I'm not surprised. Take a look at this. The dyes reveal high acid levels caused by industrial waste. <laughs> You still think the crocodile should be saved? If I get the chance, I won't hesitate to kill it. It takes a special breed to make it in there. following is a paid advertisement. Really? A paid advertisement? Wait, the B-movie cast got paid? Yes, the following is a paid advertisement. This episode of the B-movie cast is brought to you by the estate planning services of Twyla Minear Brooks, attorney at law. Remember, when the zombie apocalypse comes, things will move pretty fast. The body should be disposed of at once, preferably by cremation. Well, how long after death, then, does the body become reactivated? It's only a matter of minutes. Minutes? Well, that doesn't give people time to make any arrangements. Oh, you're right. It doesn't give them time to make funeral arrangements. The bodies must be carried to the street and, and, and burned. Uh, they must be burned immediately. Soak them with gasoline and burn them. The bereaved will have to forego the dubious comforts that a funeral service will give. Uh, they're just dead flesh and dangerous. So don't leave your estate planning needs until the last minute, because you don't know when that last minute could come. Call Twyla Minear Brooks, attorney at law, at 859-351-2294. That's 859-351-2294. Remember, when you go, you don't want people saying, Yeah, they're dead. They're all messed up. Twyla Minear Brooks, attorney at law, is licensed for practice in the state of Kentucky. Consult your local attorney for matters outside of the state of Kentucky. Command Mark, the time will be running at X minus two zero seconds. Mark, five, four, three, two, one, fire. Spawned by the continuing decline and fall of society as we know it, and created on the second floor spare bedroom studio in the Piedmont of South Carolina, podcasting on a shoestring budget and changing the world one freak at a time. It's the B-Movie Cast with your host, Vince Rotolo. Hey 
From coast to coast and worldwide via the internet, this is the B-Movie Cast, the podcast of unusual film and television. <laughs> Hi guys, and welcome back to the B-Movie Clubhouse for episode 480 of the B-Movie Cast. Be- wow, hang on, 480, that's amazing. I know, it's terribly frightening. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. Can't oh my god, it is 480 episodes, Mary, what the hell are we doing here? I don't know, <laughs> in 20 more it's going to be 500 Oh, yeah. Wow! I remember. I, I remember when you guys had your hundredth episode party. Mm-hmm. Oh my I, God! I do. I, I think that's when I started listening. Was around that time. Whew. You mm-hmm. were a wee babe then. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna have to have a big blow off for five hundred. And it's not gonna be Xanadu. Very. <laughs> <laughs> putting my Come foot on. down. <laughs> oh, what better yeah, way you're to right. celebrate? Xanadu's terrible. I think we should do. The pirate movie with Christine McNichol. No, that's another well, that, musical. Is that the Australia? That's Australian, right? Ah, you know, I yeah. want to say it was made in Australia, but it it was a uh, it was a 1982 film, and it had Christine McNichol and the guy I can't remember his name, but he was the guy in the Blue Lagoon, and oh, he yeah, would yeah, show Chris up Atkins. every time you needed a pretty blonde guy in a movie in the early 80s. Yeah. Um, oh, I think, God. I'm sorry, we're getting way ahead of ourselves here. But uh, we are. I, what does this I, have to I do was, with crocodiles? I was friends with somebody that was in the pirate movie. Oh, God, really? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, sadly, she passed away earlier this year. But so she's an Australian actress that was in a few interesting things. But yeah, that was one of them. So there you go. So you know that you should, that should definitely be on your list. <laughs> oh my God. This is okay. Okay, okay, okay. Mm. Uh, first <laughs> off, I'm sorry that I've taken us down this rabbit hole of musicals that I like. Before we but... even started the cast, mm. thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, Mary, you asked for it. You brought up <laughs> Xanadu. Why, why, don't why, you don't just... you, why don't you put it out there and get the listeners to uh, to cast votes on what should be your 500th episode done? Oh, that's brilliant, yeah. and Xanadu will win. Yes, listeners. Yeah. No! <laughs> No, yes, if you love listeners. Me at all. No, please. Um, no. Yes, listeners, bow to my will. But, but Mary, <laughs> you must realize by now that people like listening to hear you uh, in pain. Yeah, uh, how, yeah, how, I how, think how so. terrible the films are is part of the fun of listening. So <laughs> oh, you've got to be careful. <laughs> it's like a self fulfilling yeah. prophecy. If only Xanadu was terrible and not probably the best musical ever oh. made. Mm. Yeah, I, I okay. Even I felt my stomach flip when I have said you, that. What about what about the apple? Have you ever done that one? Oh dear God, no! I wouldn't be that mean. <laughs> okay, the apple. Oh wow. Oh God, I'm trying to remember who was in the apple. Oh, I don't know. Some people who wished they weren't. Oh, there were a lot of people in it that wished they weren't, but there was like a big name actress. I want to say played uh, played. That Eve. Night, the 1980 movie? Yeah. Okay, it is... Kath, Catherine Mary Stewart. Yes. Yes, it was Catherine Mary Stewart. Mm, okay. Oh, my God, I love Catherine Mary Stewart. Okay, I'm going to make I'm gonna make a rule here now. Um, the 500th movie can't be a musical. <laughs> Unless the listeners vote. I'm, Go ahead, listeners, I'm taking, vote. I'm taking control and... I'm going to overrule that one. <laughs> I'm just going to change the numbers of the shows, and suddenly it'll be 500, and you won't realize it. I think I will. When I write up the show notes, it's going to have 500 across the top, so I think I will. Hmm. Hmm. We will get back to this, yes, Mary. Okay. I think we should get on with the yes, crocodiles. I think we should. Before I go any farther, I want to get our contact information out of the way. We love hearing from all of you. So we have a feedback segment devoted to your comments and suggestions, and this is how you can contact us. Option one, pick up your phone and dial 888-936-0808. This is a toll-free number and a very easy way to leave a voice message. Option two, you can make your own MP3 file and send it in to bmoviecast at gmail.com. Or use your smartphone voice software and record a call, then just send that in as an attachment instead. Or option three, if you're not into talking, you can just shoot us an email to bmoviecast at gmail.com. 
Our website is bmoviecast.com, where you can subscribe to the podcast. It's free. And there you can join us on the Facebook BMovieCast fan page and letterbox. Also, you can play the contest by sending in your answer by email to bmoviecast at gmail.com with contest in the subject line. And check out the links while you're there or buy a t-shirt. I currently have Smalls 2 for X's. If you want to help us financially, there's a donation box you can click on as a supporter on the Lugosi, Karloff, Agar, and the infamous Xanadu level through PayPal. Also, the easiest way to donate is to click on the Amazon bar on the right side of our homepage. This Amazon link will take you to Amazon.com to make your purchase. It doesn't cost you anything, and you can still log into your personal accounts when you get there. It's completely private, so think about us before you buy online. So now, through the miracle of modern technology and thousands of miles of wires, server farms, PCs, Macs, the Internet, and duct tape, we have our co-host from Lexington, Kentucky, author, editor, screenwriter, film producer, Nick Brown. He has a new website. It is authornickbrown.com. That's A-U-T-H-O-R-N-I-C-B-R-O-W-N.com. He is the author of the Werewolf for Hire book series, starting with Blood Curse. He's also selling a book in collaboration with his wife, Fiona, the B-Movie Cookbook. All of these are available on Amazon. He's produced two movies, Wretch and Loss Prevention. Both can be ordered on Blu-rays or DVDs through Amazon. He is also the producer of a third film, the soon-to-be-released Fall of Usher. Well, before we start, I want to welcome Tracy Eliff. Eliff, E-L-L-I-F-F, to our B-MovieCast family. Uh, thank you so much for becoming one of our supporters, and we hope oh. to hear from you soon. So drop us an email or a voicemail. We really want to hear from you. So, Tracy, get on your computer. Drop us an email. We're waiting. But again, thank you. Thank you. We that really was kind of threatening, it. Mary. I mean, you know. Well, <laughs> I think I'm only half awake now. I'm not sure. We know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> You better get on and leave us an email. Okay. Partner. I'm going to stop threatening people now. And, um, and I'm going int- to introduce it's, our... <laughs> we do have a special guest. It's because we've, you, we've got you off on a bad mood talking you about really musicals. do. Man. Sorry. Sunday morning. Oof. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to introduce our special guest host, the one and only Dr. Adrian Smith. Woo! Adrian's been teaching students over Zoom for the past year and a half and is really missing the real classrooms, something he never thought would happen. During during lockdown, like everyone else, he started some podcasts. He's the co-host of Second Features with Dr. Laura Main, and they interview academics and talk about forgotten and neglected movies. And he also started Wild Wild Podcasts with Rod Barnett. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Mary, that is a fun podcast. Well, no, it's, I don't. It's Rod. Sorry. It's Rod. <laughs> What's wrong with Rod? Oh my God, Mary, you're like this, I love Rod. Uh, uh, where's I love Mary? Rod. Where? <laughs> this is like an evil doppelganger situation. I know. I think it took over. Oh, by, by the way, I just I had my um I had a COVID test and it came back negative. Woohoo! That's mm-hmm. probably why I'm evil this morning. Oh, yes, not having COVID makes you evil. No, having no. that stupid no, that's, Q-tip that's, shoved up into your brain made me evil. You know, mm-hmm. it's funny because I had to have a rapid test on Friday because I've been traveling a lot, mm-hmm. and you know they're in there tickling my brain, mm-hmm. and. I've I've become weirdly, I guess, weirdly adapted to it because I didn't even notice this time. Wow. But I I think I've had literally about 30 COVID tests in the last year or so. Yeah. Now, that said, by the way, I totally am jealous in the UK. You can just say, hey, I need a COVID test kit. And they send you, like, a seven-test kit. That's nice. Mm-hmm. And it's free. That's and nice. I bring I bring that up because I literally, to get this test on fr- last Friday, we had to book it a week in advance. Whoa. 
Yeah, because mm-hmm. there were no – you can't just go and get a COVID test in Kentucky right now. There's mm-hmm. no place that's not, like, A, booked up, and B, using uh, reservations to guide you for it. Yeah, they're like that here in South Carolina. There used to be these drive throughs all over yeah. the place that you could go to, and now it's like it took me two hours online to find a drive through place. Yeah, yeah. see, that's, that's – So you can't energy. just do it at home? You, no, the well, home you can, kits you have to buy. You have to buy them, and then they're, uh, I don't know. And they're sold out everywhere. They're sold out, yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't mean the kids just bring them home from school in big boxes, though, because they have to test themselves twice a week. Wow. Yeah. yeah. yeah but anyway, see, that's I mean, that thing. comes down to the whole thing about, you know, why it's good to have a national health service, but I'm sure that's not a discussion <laughs> we need to get into on an American podcast. Oh, don't get me started on that. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm all about national health, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Seriously. You could argue so. you could argue that I've paid for those tests with all my taxes. Mm. But I, I don't care. It's good. You just get them in the one. But I'd rather not have to do them at all. Because it's horrible. Yeah. I want this to be <laughs> over. <clears throat> yeah. Well you let's know, get back, just don't... let's get back to a simpler yes. time where the only thing we had to worry about was a giant radiated crocodile lurking just below I know. the surface. I know. How easy those days were. I know. Oh, such the the salad days when we were green <laughs> with crocodiles. Radioactive <laughs> ones, of course, but, you know. Well, duh. <laughs> uh, you know, okay, I, I just want to say, just as a quick side note, that, yes, he was a giant crocodile. The radiation, though, to me, was the real enemy in this movie. Mm-hmm. Huh. Even though they did it so wrong. <laughs> okay. I mean, okay, okay, no, 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 no. When we get, let, let, we, I'm going to pause this. I want to come back around yeah, to it though, because yeah. what I want to talk to you about, Mary, at some point, because you've worked with nuclear power for years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I really want to know your opinion about the radiation suit that the dude was wearing when he jumped <laughs> into the water. And the fact that he jumped into the water. <laughs> that he jumped into the water with it and and that his face other than a pair of welding goggles was all, it was pretty much exposed. I mean, I, to me it seemed like a suit designed to catch radiation and focus it on his head. <laughs> yeah. And one thing that, that I don't understand with it, like recently I just watched Empire of the Ants as well, the Joan Collins film. And oh my why God, is it that, I did too. Why is it that radiation that's dumped illegally somewhere in a swamp only seems to affect one particular type of animal? Like why, I mean, like, so like in that film, it's only the ants. No other bugs are made giant, just the ants. And why is it in this film just one particular crocodile, not everything that lives in the swamp? <laughs> That's the bit I don't. I mean, I know it's because they could only afford to build one giant exactly. crocodile. But like, you know, surely radiation, nuclear waste, isn't that selective yeah. in, in what gets mutated. This you know? is true. But anyway, oh. yeah, we'll, we'll be coming to you for your uh, expert opinion on that. Maybe. Well, I've, I'm probably mutated myself, so it's probably not very <laughs> expert. So, <laughs> no, that's perfect, Mary. <laughs> you know, mutant mutant reporting on mutation. Yeah. <laughs> mutant podcaster here. We, yeah, I mean, what I like about this, Mary, is that when we're listening, we can't tell which of your two heads you're speaking from. <laughs> it's see, the way you switch between the two is seamless. We'll see the earlier one where I was being evil. I, I made her show uh, that's, yeah. You turned her turned her microphone off. Yeah, I did. I, I kind of put <laughs> some duct tape on her mouth. Oh, yeah. there we go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to get on with this introduction. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, um, Adrian has now do, is now doing Wild Wild Podcast with Rod Barnett, devoted to Italian genre cinema. This first season is called Italians in Space. Mm-hmm. And has covered Mario Bava, Lucio Fulci, and Antonio Margaretti movies, amongst others, from the 50s through the 80s. Uh, next season will be Polizio Teschi. Very and good. Adrian can't wait. So what mm-hmm. is Polizio Teschi? Uh, those are, I mean, the, the easiest way to describe them is uh, Dirty Harry Ripoffs, or, or like they're basically the Italians doing Dirty Harry and the French Connection. Ah, okay. Back in the seventies, but very distinctly Italian with Italian politics and Italian. There's a lot of terrorism um, in the seventies in Italy, 
and a lot of political corruption, like, you know, pretty much everywhere. But particularly <laughs> in Italy, there seems to be a lot of that going on and open warfare in the streets between the police and gangs and fascist terrorists and communist terrorists. It was a pretty scary time. And so there's a lot of films that pick up on that. And there's usually, if they're the kind of Dirty Harry type or French connection, you know, there's one cop who has to go and bring down the bad guys by breaking the rules. And, you know, there's lots of lots of car chases and um, it's, it's they're fun. They're ah. bit, yeah, so okay. there's a lot of those. Cool. So wow. yeah, we'll be working our way. We just we do ten films per season. So I'll just pick, I mean there are hundreds of those. So we'll just be picking out ten, a combination of ten sort of, of the famous ones and some of the more obscure ones. We'll just be mixing it up a bit. I'm but, impressed. Yeah. You're so organized. So well, thank you. <laughs> I um I just decided that the easiest, the, the the more interesting way to do it would be by season. So we can just we can make very easy comparisons. So doing the space films. We started with the very first Italian space movie, which was partly directed by Mario Bava. And then we've worked our way through. So we've seen the genre grow and then eventually decline. And so it's interesting <laughs> to be able to make the comparison um, as the genre developed. And so it'll sort of that's the kind of idea with why we're doing one genre per season rather than just talking about films very randomly. It seems to be. Makes Quite sense. a nice way to focus it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And but there are loads of other films that I can't really fit in. So, like Killer Crocodile is a good example. This would be a film that I haven't yet decided whether there would be a particular season that this could fit in. Although there are several animals gone rogue uh, movies in yeah. Italy. Yeah, uh, I was going to so say maybe, maybe I'll do one of those eventually. But what was it? My favorite Italian animals gone rogue movie, I think, is Rats. Mm. The one that's yeah, set in the future, and they filmed it on the set of, uh, uh, what was it? Oh, God, it was a big budget movie. Uh, it's like Once Upon a Time in the Bronx or something. I can't remember, but I uh, love that movie. So they just took over somebody else's set. Oh, it was abandoned. This oh. was this was like four or five years later. Oh. And, oh, yeah, it was, of- oh, it's such a terrible movie. I love it. <laughs> Is it, oh, it's called, I know the one you mean, it's called Rat's Night of Terror. That's it, Rat's mm-hmm. Night of Terror, thank you. I couldn't remember yeah. the rest of it. Yeah, and so, yeah, um, it's it's I a post-apocalyptic movie with killer yeah. rats. Yeah, it's Bruno Mattai, the director. He did a bunch of, uh, he did quite a few quite terrible films. <laughs> uh, he'd, and he did a kind of unofficial Terminator sequel and an Alien sequel and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. It's quite interesting. Oh. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a really good nature run amok one called Wild Beasts, which is really interesting about how mm. in, in I can't remember if it's actually set in Rome, but again it's a pollution thing. The water supply gets polluted, and it's the water supply to the zoo, so all the zoo animals go berserk and break out. And there's some amazing scenes of of kind of panthers and things just walking down the middle of the street in the city, and people getting attacked by basically by escaped zoo animals. That's pretty crazy. So, yeah, there's a there's there are quite a few interesting uh, ones, and not all of them directly ripping off Jaws, although this one clearly is. <laughs> I was going to say they're not. They all can't be the last shark. <laughs> no, although I mean there's a, there's a couple of other Jaws ripoffs like uh, Cruel Jaws. Yeah, um, is another quite well known one that uh, actually, oh, I think God. actually incorporates footage from. Jaws, possibly. I, or at least I was going to say, isn't Cruel Jaws the one that actually stole all the footage from uh, from the last shark? Oh, possibly. Yeah, there's a lot oh of over my God, it's easy to lose track. Yeah. I've just realized <laughs> I've watched way too many bad Italian movies. Oh, <laughs> you can't you can't watch too many. <laughs> That's true. That's true. There are so many that no matter how many you watch, there will still be tons more you haven't seen. Well, it's t- impossible t- to run out. So with our podcast, we're only really skimming the surface. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I thought, the reason I wanted to start it and get Rod on board, obviously because Rod is an experienced podcaster and it helps to talk to somebody else who knows what they're doing. And he was more than happy to join in because I was going to be the one doing all the editing. So all he has to do is watch the film and then turn up and talk about it. <laughs> so that's quite good. 
But um, it's just an opportunity to talk about films that don't get discussed very often on podcasts. So cool. you know, that was that was one of my goals with that. But anyway, but also thank so thank you for giving me the opportunity to choose a film to talk about with you today. Yes. Because Killer Crocodile is a film I'd love to do on our podcast, but because of my own rules, we probably won't get to it for about five years. <laughs> And, and by this time, this one everyone anyway, so, will see yeah. it. No, you don't have to worry <laughs> about it. Well, as you all know now, Adrian's pick was Killer Crocodile from 89. Mm. Directed by Fabrizio De Angelis, a.k.a. Larry Ludman. I love that. Um, it's, it's Italy's answer to Jaws. The bad guys get theirs. Good guys learn some valuable lessons. And it sets you up for Killer Crocodile 2 that was filmed at the same time. That mm. makes sense. Um, you actually get to see the crocodile within minutes of the start of the film, so I love that. Uh, there's a, there's also a gorgeous bottom of the first victim within seconds of the movie starting, <laughs> and I was jealous, by the way. And um, um, a one, I, I have to say, I thought I didn't notice. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was too busy being overwhelmed by um, Anthony Crenna's acting. Oh, okay, okay. I was I'm overwhelmed by the point of view shot of the crocodile. I thought that was great. <laughs> I love that. But I guess they did that because of Jaws, huh? But what they, I mean, crucially, what they did, because Jaws obviously famously was a nightmare to film because they tried to, you know, Spielberg wanted to do it out in the real sea and the robot shark just kept getting fritzed by the seawater and all that sort of stuff. And so what these guys realized was we can do the same story. I mean, a bit like the movie of Piranha, which also borrows very heavily from Jaws. They realized they could do the same story, but they can shoot it in about three feet of water. And it's a lot easier to operate a mechanical creature when you're just filming in a very shallow bit of water. Yeah. Wasn't there somebody which, inside of the thing? I think they did build a kind of robotic croc. <laughs> um, and it was very realistic. I mean, yeah, hard to tell yeah. that it wasn't a real crocodile. But um, yeah, they built a real special effect crocodile. Yeah. That. It's more realistic looking than the crocodile sub, or is it an alligator sub that James Bond uses in one of his films? <laughs> yes, that's. <laughs> it's way better than that. And I have to also throw in there, because I think I mentioned that I have watched a few killer crocodile, killer alligator type movies uh, kind of leading up to this because, you know, you brought this movie up and I was like, ooh, I love killer crocodile, <laughs> which <laughs> nobody ever says those words yes. in that order, by yes. the way. But I uh, went ahead and watched Alligator. I watched, and oh, wait, The Great Alligator uh, with Barbara Bach. Uh, I watched Alligator which was a 1980 movie, and I'm trying to remember who was in it, but I love that film. And I watched Lake Placid. Oh, just, I've never seen you know, it, but I know of it. That's supposed to oh, be a good one, isn't it? What Lake Placid's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. It's funny. It's a horror comedy, yeah. and for the most part, they make it work. And I, it's got Betty White in it. I mean, <laughs> come on. Wow. Yeah. So is that but, the one with the... the um, Oh no, hang on. So that so which one did you say? Alligator? Is that the New York one with the alligator in the subway in the sewers? Alligator yeah, alligator is the one with the with the alligator in the new in okay. the New York sewers. Because yeah. apparently somebody flushed it down the toilet. But mm. I will I will give you this, they did not use radiation for that one. This giant alligator was a giant alligator because the local uh, pharmaceutical company was having an a what was it as unscrupulous uh, pet store owner sell them dogs mm -hmm. that they could use for experiments with their growth hormone Ew. and yeah and so they'd kill these dogs and this was horrible by the way <laughs> they kill the dogs and then this pet store owner had to get rid of them because you know what pharmaceutical mm -hmm. lab doing animal testing would actually have a way of getting rid of you know <laughs> test subject animals. Jeez, that's weird. So, anyway, he was taking them down into the sewers. 
and oh. dumping them. Oh. And there, the little crocodile was eating these uh, these growth dogs that dogs. were killed with a experimental ho- growth hormone. So mm. next thing it's you kind know, of a, I mean, it's quite it's a success story. Really, he's the little alligator who could, and uh, he just he saw an opportunity <laughs> and he just kept growing and kept growing. Yeah, I remember he, this. This was a real sort of urban legend, wasn't it, at the time that this film was yes. playing? Yeah, but they really were still an urban they really were alligators in the sewers because people were flushing pets away, and you should never flush live animals down because they'll grow into mutants and mm-hmm. eat people. I mean, that was a real a real fear that people had, isn't it? It is, and I'm going to just say for the listener's benefit that you should never flush live animals down the toilet because that's being a dick. Yes. <laughs> Yes. You know, that's yes. just, it's not nice. You know, yeah. don't, just don't buy your kid an alligator when you go to Florida, first off. And that yeah. used to be a big deal. There would be roads. I remember when I was a kid and we went to Florida, and there were literally, we drove past a roadside stand where the guy had a table set up and he was selling alligators. Uh-uh. Yeah. To this take home. Like, were you gonna, where are you going to put that in your car? Oh, it was baby alligators, dude. They were selling oh, yeah, just like in the movie. It was like, hey, here's your little cute baby alligator in a fish bowl. Well, sort of, I was going to say, oh, they okay. put them in those plastic bags like they did with fish. No, they. <laughs> this guy was selling fish bowls and all. Oh, so okay. I think, I want to say in 1980, it was about 25 bucks. <laughs> which, by the way, I, I'm ashamed to admit, but like 11-year-old Nick was all like, ooh, let's oh, get an yeah. alligator, Mom. And Mom yeah. was like, no. And I'm very glad my mom said no. Because, I mean, those things live for years. You would still have that as a pet now. I know. I would. Oh, my God. I'm at, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it would eat my other pets. Dear yes. Lord. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I would turtles. train it to be a. Uh, what? The little turtles. They, they, they painted their shells, and you can get them at the 5 and 10, the, the 5 and 10 stores. The, okay. Uh, okay. The five and ten stores. Well, that's what they were back then. You know. I'm the... sorry. Hang on a second. I'm getting a phone call. Bring, 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 bring. Uh, oh, this is the 1960s. Bling, we want our store bling. names back. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> is that the say? Is that the Seven Eleven before inflation? Uh, no. They oh my were like God. The, uh, the Murphys. The Oh, what were they? What were uh, they Mary, called? you're about to continually throw out a bunch of American store names from like the from, past twenty years. Yeah, so that Adrian's one. probably not going to get. <laughs> well, well, I've seen a lot of old films. So, yeah, Hank, so you're saying so you could buy alligators by the side of the road and turtles in just a regular grocery local, store. N- well, they were. What were the names of those stores, Nick? Help me. Not even a pet shop, just like a shop that you'd go to to buy some beans. No, they they didn't have food. They were like oh, clothing see. and... I don't know which stores you're talking about, but I want to know where turtles. I can buy clothes and turtles. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, like it sounds Walmart like Amazon.com. Now, well, well, what? Walmart has like fish section mm-hmm. where they used to. I don't know if they still do or not. It was delicious. <laughs> so you... Nick, if you'd still had that alligator now, that would be interesting. You're, there'd be no pet dogs or cats in the whole block where you live, and nobody no, would know and why. And it's because of this alligator t- you've got in the garden. I know. I would totally be a super villain if I had an alligator. <laughs> I'd love to see you with a harness taking it for a walk. Yeah. Which, who's living, wearing the harness in a flooded the base, deliberately flooded basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Flooded yeah. basement. Yeah, they'd have a, a habitat. I keep the, I keeps me a gator in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> and you you mentioned the other film you mentioned was the Great Alligator. And oh that's, my um, god, that's such a bad movie. <laughs> that one's interesting. Is that was we talked about Killer Crocodile and Killer Crocodile Two both being shot at the same time, and I think the Great Alligator was shot back to back with Island of the Fishmen. In this, cause the same director, it's Whoa. Barbara Bach again, shot on the same tropical island. I think they just shot those two films. Back. Yeah, I think Nick just watched it for Barbara Bach. Yeah, well, well okay. Yeah. If I want to watch a Barbara Bach movie, I'll, there's a lot better Barbara Bach movies to watch out mm-hmm. there. Okay, hey, she, she's actually the star of the uh, the latest episode of our podcast because she the, we just did one on the humanoid, oh. which is a, a great Star Wars ripoff. 
Mm. And she's kind of a evil supervillain. In that, it's very funny. She did quite a lot of Italian films around this time. In fact, I think that's the Humanoid is the same year as The Great Alligator. Mm. Yeah, that was the year yeah. that her career kind of took a tank. It feels like, but you know. <laughs> That's okay, because Barbara Bach would go on to date Ringo Starr and then marry him. Really? So, yeah, Barbara Bach is Ringo Starr's wife. Like yeah, they, did, they, they met on another movie, didn't they? The, um... Yeah, Caveman. Caveman. Oh. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, it all works out for the best. And yes. she actually... Uh, and, okay, say what you will about Barbara Bach, but she uh, started a non-profit to help uh, with drug and alcohol addiction also because she and Ringo Starr both kind of went through it in the 80s -hmm. and they came out on the other side and she was like I need to help people and so she and another actress actually started a uh, rehab and support charity basically to help people get off of drugs and alcohol Cool. cool so but this isn't the Barbara Bach cast. No. No. Well, that's not a bad idea. Uh, no, that, I would totally be down uh-huh. for the Barbara Bach cast. But um, <laughs> uh, why are you sighing, Because there's Mary? too She's many movies d- to like. <laughs> yeah, I know. So yeah, many ones. So to many, yeah. So down. many movies. Yes. Oh. Yeah. But, but, yeah, The Great Alligator, I actually, you know, I was watching that film. And the one thing that struck me as I'm watching it was that it makes Killer Crocodile look like an epic motion picture. Wow. It does, because on top of everything else, they did not have a giant crocodile for this movie. The Great Alligator. So they're constantly filming stuff from, like, they put a, a camera inside, like, a crocodile puppet. Or something, and so they're constantly filming from like in the mouth, and they're constantly filming from the crocodile's point of view, and <laughs> because they because just they don't have, have a good one. crocodile. Aww. Or I'm well, it's a terrible crocodile because it's an alligator. Excuse me, <laughs> but I digress. <sighs> well, did did either of you watch the Severn Blu-ray of this? Yes. Oh, cool. Were the yeah, I did not get to. Yeah, well, I, I I've heard that it's a double disc set, set with this sequel. And, yeah, and which I haven't watched the sequel yet, to be honest. Oh, what? I know. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> now that's drama. okay, but I it was so funny because okay, two years ago, almost to the month, I decided I was going to do 31 films of Halloween. Mm-hmm. And my 31 films of Halloween, I had two criteria. It had to be some kind of horror movie. And I didn't care what genre of horror. Also, it had to be a movie I had not seen before. Mm. And so I really was going through some very interesting films because I watch a lot of horror movies. And so a significant portion of the ones that I did that month were ones that weren't that great. Now, that said, Killer Crocodile and Killer Crocodile 2, I felt were a gift from God because <laughs> I could enjoy them. They were funny yeah. to watch. Yeah. Maybe not intentionally funny, but they were funny. But also, it was two movies that I hadn't seen for the price of one because mm. really they were almost the same movie. It's just... Were they you the know, same it, actors? Well, it was the same actors, yeah. And, you know, it's just... it's Well, the ones that survived the first one. Well, yeah. It's the not even... I don't think it's even a proper sequel, is it? Like, it's not, they're not the same characters, I don't think. I know, it's got some well, of the same characters, but the, oh, okay. the plot is like... In the first one, they're, they're a bunch of hippie environmentalists who, for some reason, are on a boat in whatever... South American country this is supposed to be and that that was never really defined as far as I could tell but you know they're out looking for this they're looking for contamination in the water and come upon nuclear waste being dumped in the water and in Killer Crocodile 2 it's more like the Anthony Crenna's character has just 
he's been around now for a few years, and suddenly he's supposed to be the grizzled. He's supposed to be the grizzled Quint character, uh-huh. and he's trying to help a model in the second one. Okay. It's very, very strange. It's a it's a great Italian film plot, but. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I just watched it. I will, I will watch it eventually. Can we get on with the contest first before we go any further? Ooh. Oh, did we have a yeah. contest, Mary? Yeah. <clears throat> what was the movie? Forbidden World. Forbidden World, and that was the uh, directorial debut of our uh, guest, Alan Holzman. Yes. And yes. so that's why I stuck that film out there. And. It's funny because I heard rumor that some people people were having a hard time guessing what it was. Yeah. And, well, the thing is, I felt like if I put a picture that actually showed the mutant, mm-hmm. then everybody would be like, oh, it's Forbidden World, you know, but, you know, because so the mutant. you decided to be mean and make it hard. Yeah. <sighs> Uh, you know what, Mary? I, I, I'm 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 done here because every it's like Nick. You made the contest too easy. Nick, you made the contest too hard. I like Nick, when my easy. You, you like it easy. Yeah. You aren't even playing. I know. But Mary, if it's too easy, you'll have to get more ping pong balls. Oh, believe me, I have enough. <laughs> <laughs> I have a whole bucket full. Okay, you'll have to come up with more prizes. How about that? Well, uh, we have, I'm all uh, out of sports. Pa- <laughs> Patrick, <laughs> Patrick um, just sent me a new updated list with more movies he's donating. So, woohoo! Oh wow, thank you, Patrick. I know, I know, that's great. But today, our first movie was donated by Patrick. It's the Star Wars trilogy episodes four, five, and six: uh, The New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, and The Return of the Jedi. So that's, wow, that's a good prize. A Why really are we giving good away prize. a good prize, Mary? What's going on? I don't know. <laughs> but we will give it away. And the winner is Santito. Well, good, because he's giving a prize away himself this week. <laughs> So basically, you're just trading prizes. If Patrick (laughs) Kelly wins the prize, this would be so brilliant. Yeah, well, I'm glad he didn't win his own prize, so that works. Well, put a a ping pong ball in for Patrick Kelly (laughs) so that it'll be a possibility. No, no, he already won one. Can't do that. Uh, That would be cheating. Anyway, our second movie has been donated by Brenda McNeil. Thank you, Brenda. And Ooh. I'm hoping that you'll send some feedback from the nostalgia convention that you just came back from. Oh, you, cool. Yeah, and didn't Paul, Paul Mintern, Paul the... Um, postman, Paul the retired mailman, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, he went there too, so I want to hear about that nostalgia convention. Anyway, the movie she donated is 1939 classic, The Man They Could Not Hang. Oh, I love that film. Uh, yeah. It stars Boris Karloff, Lorna Gray, Charles Tobridge, and Dick Curtis. It's a mad scientist, Dr. Henrik Savard, who's Karloff. He's obsessed with bringing the dead back to life. Police are alerted to Savard's activities. However, Savard is arrested, convicted, and sentenced to hang. He vows revenge on the judge, jury, and district attorney. After hanging, his assistant claims the corpse and uses Savard's technique to bring the doctor back to life. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. So the winner is... Dax Bradley. Congratulations, Dax. Oh, man, Dax. You're yeah. piling up the movies. I know, I know, I know. Um, the third prize is the mystery gift from Kenny B., Santito, it's guaranteed to be worth more than the two minutes it took you to enter the contest. <laughs> it's guaranteed to be a DVD or a Blu-ray, a book or a magazine, and some knickknack and something from south of the border, preferably legal something. Whoever the, <laughs> whoever the wow, is. Mary, you just made <laughs> Santito a drug smuggler. You realize <laughs> that, don't you? Well, he said it. I didn't. Oh, okay. Well, there you <clears throat> go. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Whoever the winner is, you have to promise to let us know what the mystery is because I love mysteries and I want to know. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. You love mysteries, but you want the answer. 
Well, yeah. Okay. Because I'm me. Fair. Okay. And the winner is Christopher Page. Yay. So congratulations, Christopher. Yeah, and big congrats. And I am curious what the prize is. I'm serious. I want to know. So on with the show. Contest is over. The contest is over. The show is just begun. Yes. Yes. The and Killer our movie Crocodile is... Show. What is our movie, Mary? Killer Crocodile. <gasps> Killer Crocodile? <clears throat> wow, that shut that us all up. Yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> and I did not like the environmentalists in this movie. <laughs> they were the worst. Mm. I wanted them to get ever. eaten. Oh, my God. Well, okay, I do have to say. Uh, drive-in Academy Award nominations for Richard Grenna's kid. <laughs> it's like, talk about... Uh, he was pretty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding that. He was, he, he, was, he was a little something for the ladies, but that's about it. Oh. That dude, he was not great. He was not that bad. I didn't He know. wasn't? Were no. we watching the same movie? Yeah. Somebody else in there was really bad. Who was it? I can't remember who um, it was. Everybody. Yeah, you'll have to narrow it down more. Yeah, than that. that's true. Some of them <laughs> were really, really stilted. I mean, they're just there to be eaten, basically. I mean, that's the whole that's point true. of any of them. That's true. I mean, who is the hero of this film? That's something we need to try and figure out, maybe. Who's supposed to be the hero? Uh, you know... I don't know that there was a, a true hero other than the crocodile. <laughs> I mean, I feel like the crocodile was the hero because the crocodile heroically was trying to get rid of the stupidest environmentalists that ever lived. Mm-hmm. And, you know, despite the poor crocodile's best efforts, some of them get away. And that's just, you know, that's just ridiculous. But yes, I feel like the uh, crocodile was the the hero of the movie. And okay, so I'm watching the film with Fiona, and the entire time I'm watching the film, she just kept going, "Oh, poor Van Johnson." <laughs> yeah, really? I was just going to say, who would have expected him to turn up in this film? Yeah, and he's just he's just there, and it's so it's it's like you know he was just. I happened to be vacationing in South America when they were filming this or something. And I wanted the money. And needed the money to, you know, continue to buy those really weird white neckerchiefs and stuff. And so he was just there. He was there the one sweating. I was saying was, was, yeah, disappointing. Oh, was he the one he that you were one, disappointed in his acting? Yeah, yeah. He was very stilted and very, like... I don't know. I, I imagine I, when he was making this film, he would he was been very much under the impression that nobody was ever going to see it. Well, that's true. Yeah, for, as far as I, he was concerned, this was an Italian film. It, you know, it wasn't going to have any influence on on his Hollywood career because yeah. nobody would ever know. He didn't know that we'd be watching it on Blu-ray thirty, 30 years later. <laughs> it yeah, it was really late in his career too, though. Yeah. And I mean, bear in mind, he was 73 when he shot this film. Yeah. Mm. You know, he was, he had, and it, okay, Van Johnson, I mean, his film credits go all the way back to the 1940s. I know. Mm. And so he was a name, and they kind of scored him for this. And I do, I feel like it's one of those things, you know, like, well, you know, I need some money, so I'll just do whatever film comes along. Mm. Yeah, that's well, I, I think that's why I thought he would be a better actor in it. I think the problem was he was trying too hard to be a good actor in a movie oh. full of not good actors. Yeah, and he wasn't exactly given great dialogue. No, <laughs> yeah. No. Mm-mm. Of course, he lived to be 92, so he lived yeah. like nearly 20 years after making this film. So hopefully he lived long enough to uh, have people say, hey, you were in Killer Crocodile. I love that oh. film. Or something, and he'd probably be really disappointed by that. Yeah. I was going to say, I, <laughs> how would you depress Van Johnson? 
walk <laughs> up to Van Johnson and say, hey, you were a killer crocodile. <laughs> and he'd be like, all the other films I've done, and this is the one you remember me for? I, I was on the set for like two days, and all I did was sweat and walk around. Mm-hmm. Actually, to be fair, he, like many of the cast members, did end up in the water at one point. That's true. And that was him in that nasty water. So good good for Van Johnson. <laughs> you know, Where that's being it? a trooper. Where was it um, filmed? It's the Dominican Republic, I believe. Yeah, I think it was the Dominican Republic, but they never define where it's supposed to be set. Yeah. You know, it's just some some lawless third world country where the white guys apparently run everything. Oh, I'm, I'm and, and Anthony Crenna. I'm looking up Dominican Republic because I'm not really sure where it is. Oh, it's, it's, um, stuck, it's stuck on Haiti. It's, it's in yeah. the other half of Haiti. Yeah, it's the other side of the of the island for Haiti. Oh, okay. Well, know, geography realize, lesson I'm is over. I'm sorry, I didn't realize Haiti was that far south. But for some reason, I thought it was much further north, more like by the Bahamas. Okay. Well, the no. Bahamas are kind of stuck out in the middle of the ocean, too. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's that's thing that always surprises me, you know, because you go down to the, uh, the quote-unquote, the islands, and... The Bahamas, I always thought they were kind of in that chain of islands that kind of leads down to Haiti and that area. And they're like, well, the Bahamas are way oh, out in the no. middle of the ocean. I was thinking it was up near Bermuda, which is really out in the middle of nowhere. Well, all this talk of these islands has just got that Beach Boys song in my head now. Yeah, I was just thinking that myself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Beach Boys. I just kept thinking they... Sh- Needed a lot of bug spray. I don't think that was going to help them with the crocodile. No, no, but <laughs> can you can you get crocodile spray? I don't know. Is a it like bat, bat, anti- like bat repellent? Spray might have worked. <laughs> I think bat, Batman's Batman. got some crocodile spray. Right, and he probably does. Probably. Of course he does. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, I, I did get the feeling of the heat and the nastiness and the the overwhelming humidity in that film. Mm. They did Which, of course, wasn't a special effect, I would imagine. Oh, I mean, that's what's, what's good about these films, because they're so cheap. Yeah. What you see is what they were really doing a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. So if everything, you know, they didn't have time to uh, to clean everything up for the film or, or whatever. It's just they filmed where they were in the conditions they were in. So if it looks dirty and if it looks uncomfortable and if it looks sweaty... Then it just was. It was, yeah. And that's kind of one of the things I enjoy about these films is you know, the, the discomfort and the danger that they're putting themselves in on screen mm-hmm. is part, you know, is all real. Really. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, you fun. see a James Bond movie in these in these weird little countries, and you don't get yeah. that. Yeah, you know that there are no leeches attaching themselves to Sean Connery. Right. And, and, right. Whereas here, who knows what was biting them in that water as they're waiting for it. I know it was super impressive that all these yeah. cast members were in that water constantly. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know they weren't paid what they needed to be paid to be doing that. That's well, no. for sure. Yeah. Did Krenna, Krenna got dysentery wise in this? <laughs> Which I could. I could. I'm surprised they didn't all get dysentery. Yeah. From this film. I was going to say, is he the only one who got it? <laughs> He had, he had to provide his own um, stupid wardrobe. That's cheap. I have mm-hmm. a feeling that a lot of folks in this movie provided oh, yeah. their own wardrobe. Yeah. yeah. Well, except for Van Johnson. Okay, why wouldn't Van Johnson? I have a feeling that was Van you, Johnson's you, actual <laughs> I'm in the Dominican Republic <laughs> outfit. Okay? Yeah. <sighs> oh. oh. Oh, poor oh, Van Johnson. <laughs> I know. I know. He was in the Kane Mutiny in Rich Man, Poor Man. and y- Yes, he was a very well-known movies. actor at the time. Yeah. And um, quite a lot of murder she wrote, I think. Y- yeah. He did yeah. do that. <laughs> <Later> <laughs> Although on. pretty much anybody who was anybody sure. did that. 
I was going to say that was that was kind of your that was the uh, wagon train of the eighties. Mm-hmm. Was you <laughs> pop up on Murder She Wrote and get killed by Angela Lansbury? <laughs> yeah. Or not by no. Angela Lansbury? Yeah. Your murder gets solved by <laughs> Angela <laughs> Lansbury. Well, no, come well, on. I we just, all know I that the one the one factor Lansbury. that links all of those murders is Angela Lansbury. I'm not she was she, she was there the whole time. That's true. Yeah, she was actually a secret serial killer in that show. Yeah. That's what I think. And <laughs> she, she was, was very good snake. at framing other people. Oh, yeah. Leave her alone. I like her. I like that series. I remember watching that as a kid. As a kid? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Mary, uh, this was the eighties. It was. Yeah, no. so the fact that you remember watching it as a kid terrifies yeah, but me. Mary is still a kid. <laughs> That's true. true. Mary's a kid at I heart. I never did grow up. This is very true. What was that? I'm trying to look it up and I can't. It was the 80s, Mary. 80s, it was like 1987. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Okay. I can say I watched it as a kid, and I would still be stretching it because I was a high-end teenager at that point. I wonder why I was watching it. Because everybody <laughs> watched it. That's true. I don't even remember where, where I was in the eighties. <laughs> wow, you were having a great a time. By the time <laughs> <laughs> oh well, never mind. It's on right now. And a lot of those weird television. Oh, it's always on somewhere. It's, yeah, it's like, yeah. Like Friends, it's just never. It's never not on telly. <laughs> oh well. So I've been looking forward to hearing how Nick was going to summarize the plot for this film. <laughs> oh wow! Well, do we want to talk about the actors first? I mean, yeah. I, we've kind of talked around actor Richard Crenna and Van Johnson, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. we haven't really talked about them. Was Was Richard Crenna in the Blob? Was okay, the his blob son or? was. Oh, okay. Okay, bear in he was mind in the this is blob. not. Yeah, this was not a Richard Crenna movie. This was a Richard, Richard Crenna's Anthony. son, yeah. whose name sounds like Richard Crenna because he's Richard Anthony Crenna. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's sometimes credited as Richard Crenna Jr. Yeah, I believe. So yeah, and so that's sort of like when you hire Frank Stallone, so that you can put Stallone on the on the poster. Uh-huh. And you're just putting the first, the last name and like a tiny little F in front of it. So you can say, look, this movie's got Stallone. Oh, it, yeah. Oh, he you did know. the blob right before he did Killer Crocodile. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, to what, be what fair, he did, <laughs> he did the blob remake. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not. And yeah. uh, okay, I I am going to say, by the way, the blob remake gets a lot of grief. I think it was actually a very decent remake um it really stepped up the gore factor but it was definitely a decent remake and i've never yeah. seen it I'm you've never to, seen I've it i've never seen the remake wasn't it okay. directed by larry hagman or something? for real i want to say it was hold on a second now chuck russell directed it yeah oh i don't know like that <laughs> yeah but it had shawnee yeah, smith yeah. kevin dillon so, and, okay, it had Kevin Dillon and, uh, oh, God. Of course, it had Richard Crenna's kid in it, though, but, yeah. And I think he gets eaten pretty early on in it, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, no, he did um, Son of the Blob, didn't he, Larry Hagman? That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, oh, God, yeah, that was, Sorry. oh, wow. Yeah, no, that's... I was sitting here trying to think of which movie. Yeah, this was the this was the nineteen eighty eight yeah. remake. Was it eighty eight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I actually saw that in the theater, by the way. So, the yes, I, I went to the theater to see it. Oh, oh, beware the blob. Is the yeah. other name for son of the blob? <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, so many bad movies. Out there. That's okay, Boy, and hey. we've gone down the blob rabbit yes, hole yeah. here. I'm sorry. See, but hey, there's another contender for episode 500. Uh, there you go, Mary. <laughs> okay, oh, what, Mary, okay, Mary, you're groaning. Yeah. How do you get more B-movie than the Blob remake? Mm. The Blob. I think we've the done blob? the Blob, Did Mary. Okay. I, okay. Okay, this is the tragedy of doing 480 episodes. <laughs> no, you can't Because remember. I literally don't remember half the movies we've done. It's like... I've seen them, but did we talk about them on the podcast? Did we do a podcast episode? It all becomes this hazy muck. I know. I really do need to post, like, a database on our website. Wow, you're you are very. Uh, what's the best word Nick for it? Nick needs to post a database. On the I was website. gonna say you're very free with volunteering me to come up with stuff, Mary. <laughs> And, yeah, I will post a database. Okay, folks, if you go on to the B-MovieCast website, there's a little search bar up in the top right-hand corner, and just type in a word that goes with a movie title, and odds are it will show you if we did it or not. Oh. Really? Wait, Mary, you didn't know that? No. (laughs) That's why I created that database, because I couldn't figure out what movies we had done okay uh, uh, even as we speak ladies and gentlemen i actually can feel mary navigating to the b movie cast website and looking for the the search bar that i spoke of you're right so i'm gonna be quiet <sighs> while i type because i can't type that's okay. it now. Mary's gone for the rest of this episode yes, yeah, just looking up bye. looking up the films <laughs> we've done <laughs> Well, I tell you what, Adrian, why don't you tell us a little bit about the uh, the guy who made this movie, the, okay. the visionary oh, genius behind <laughs> Killer Crocodile. Fabrizio De Angelis. Um, yeah, he's an interesting guy. So he's mainly known as a producer rather than a, a director. He directed a few films, including this one. Um <laughs> But not crucially, not the sequel. He didn't do Killer Crocodile 2. Really? Um, Which I think no. is funny. Yeah. Huh. He did some films that I'm sure you must have seen or at least would be into. Nick, films like um, Karate Warrior and uh, Cobra Mission and Golden Kimono Warrior, which was a TV show. Uh, this is interesting range of stuff. But yeah, primarily he was a, um, a producer. And as a producer, he did some pretty well-known, uh, by cult film standards anyway, quite well-known films. So he did things like Zombie Flesh Eaters, also yep. known as Zombie, the Lucio Fulci film. He did a few Fulci movies. He also did The Beyond, which is an incredible film. House by the Cemetery, New York Ripper, Manhattan Baby. Um, so those are all quite famous Fulci movies. He also produced... Um, my one of my favorite trilogies, the Bronx Warriors trilogy. I oh, love uh, those. Oh, those are great films. So he produced the producer on those, which is pretty amazing. So, and he did. Um, he even produced one of the ripoffs of his own film. So after the success of Zombie Flesh Eaters, we had a film called Zombie Holocaust, <laughs> and he was the producer of that. And I think he came up with the story. So he he was not. There was no kind of artistic pretension. If something would make money, he'd do it. Um, so he'd rip off his own films. And um, in fact, he produced the producer on a film that I just bought on Blu-ray in a sale the other day called Paganini Horror, which is a um, Luigi Cozzi film. So, yeah, he had a very busy career as a producer and occasional director. So he produced Killer Crocodile 2 but actually handed the reins over to somebody else on that one well, um, you know, so he so came tired. into it in the sort of 70s and 80s he was he worked on quite a few other movies including some Polizia Teschi films some of the Black Emmanuel films um, he was the you know, best production manager so uh, he did quite a lot of interesting stuff Right, going right back to some westerns he did one of the Satana 
uh, westerns. Um, he worked on a film which is actually on a list, one of my Wild Wild podcast lists is for Italian comedies. And one of this guy's early films was called When Men Carried Clubs and Women Played Ding Dong, which is a kind of Italian <laughs> sexy caveman comedy. <laughs> Um, which is a man. <laughs> okay, that. So, yeah. Wow. I know. So yeah, so he's had a very interesting career right through the seventies into producing and directing in the eighties and into the early nineties when the bottom really fell out of the um, the kind of genre, particularly the more sort of straight to video stuff that really fell out of the Italian industry in, in the late eighties and nineties. That's when things really kind of reach the bottom, unfortunately. So you see a lot of filmmakers like this guy, their careers just sort of dried up in the uh, early 90s. And I don't exactly know why, but I'm sure it all just comes down to money. But uh, but yeah, quite a long... If you look at his credits on the IMDb, he had a lot of interesting stuff. And he's still around now for Brizio de Angelis. Um, oh, he is? I believe. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, he's still, I mean, he's he's only, still alive. How old would he be now? He's about 80 now, I guess. He was born in okay. 1940. Yeah, so yeah, so he'd be probably about still around. I think he pops up occasionally on interviews and things, although not for the Blu-ray that I've got. But, but yeah, so quite interesting, lots of cool stuff. Worth. I mean, obviously, you know, I'm not going to make any great claims for him. It's by mainstream standards... His films as directors are not great, but they're very they're always entertaining. And again, the films he's produced are very entertaining films. What did the Italian industry move on to after it kind of quit doing these? Um, I think uh, well, they they just uh, there were still some of the cheaper films being made. I think more in the erotic thriller kind of genre. Mm. Um, but I think the industry moved primarily to television. Television became more of where things were being made rather than film. Oh, okay. Um, and, yeah, it just seemed to, as an industry, just really ground to a halt. And if there were films being made in Italy, they, they were more of the art film uh, okay. rather than the uh, genre stuff that we were more interested in. Do you ever watch Breakfast with Dracula? Breakfast with Dracula? No. Okay. <laughs> Is that one of his? Yeah. I've missed that one. He produced it. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Again, okay. it sounds fun. I, I Yeah, it kind of yeah. sounds like it would be a comedy. Yeah, I would have thought so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are so many. I mean, just so many different things. I think, oh yeah, no, you're right. That was one of the last things that he directed. Um, oh, where he directed. Hitchhiker, uh, Dracula hitchhikes to Miami and works as a model. Huh. Um, I have to get my yeah. hands on that. Okay, yeah. wait a minute. You don't want to watch Xanadu, but you want to watch a movie <laughs> where, a gu- where Dracula hitchhikes to Miami to be a model. Yeah. There you go. Okay. There's another, I mean, how, another I, candidate. <laughs> What kind of story could that possibly be? That's got to be great. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of the a lot of uh, Italian genre films were made in Florida. Um, I think during the 80s and early 90s, I think there was a big tax break offer for film crews to come there, and you get films like Nightmare Beach, for example. It's got a well-known one, John Saxon, yeah. kind of slash, slasher, possibly supernatural kind of film. Uh, all shot in Miami, but with an Italian director, Italian crew, uh, and a mixture of Italian and, and American cast. And it sounds like Breakfast with Dracula is another one of those. <laughs> I'm sure hey. just, yeah. It's the kind of things well, where the tax breaks were so good, the tax deals were so good, that these films would make a profit before they'd even finished filming. So it didn't even matter if the finished film was any good or not they would wow. still make some money out of it. He, you know, they were pretty good deals. But I think it was when deals like that all just sort of dried up that everybody gave up and moved on to something else. <laughs> well, that's it. Yeah. Because remember, at the same time that the Italian kind of the knockoff movies were coming out, 
was also the period where the direct video thing really rose to the surface. Mm. And so you had a ready-made market for these low-budget knockoff movies, essentially. Because mm-hmm. I've seen so many of the movies that uh, this guy directed without ever knowing, you know, Fabrizio De Angelis from, you know, a hole in the wall. Mm-hmm. Because they were all on the shelf in the video store in the 90s. So, you know, I would go in, I'm like, ooh, the Bronx Warrior, you know. Ooh, yeah. let's watch that. Or the zombie holes American film, so you wouldn't know. Yeah. And the other thing, okay, I feel like, and, you know, you're kind of the expert on the subject matter here, Adrian, but mm-hmm. was it a lot of the Italian kind of the knockoff cinema, I feel like it was very cyclical based around what was popular at the time in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Because remember in the 80s, there was also that big wave of post-apocalyptic Italian films. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, and that to me that kind of took over. That kind of replaced the spaghetti western. It was the spaghetti holocaust, mm-hmm. and you know you would have you know films like Rats, films like The Bronx Warriors, which was not a post-apocalyptic, but it kind of was. But yeah. then you had all those like Warriors of the Wasteland and a bunch of films like that that were just straight up post-apocalyptic, and half of them had Donald Pleasance in them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he would appear in anything. He would. I love Donald Pleasance to <laughs> death. But that man, oh, my God, he was in so many bad movies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh. it, it, you're right. It, it, they would call them Filoni, um, these kind of cycle, genre cycles. And, yeah, it was based on whatever was popular at the time, they just make more of that and possibly even name their film to sound like a sequel to that other film. Um, And there was no sort of shame in it. (laughs) Quite often, very brazenly just ripping people off and using scores without permission and stuff like that. Um, But yeah, it was was just, if that's big, then great, let's make more of those until they stop selling and then yeah. you do another thing. So Spaghetti Westerns, obviously, you know, on the back of um, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, everybody was making Spaghetti Westerns. Um, yeah, you might like Mad Max. And The Warriors as well was a big influence. Obviously, The Bronx Warriors is a great combination yeah. of Mad Max 2 and The Warriors and stuff like that. Um, there were low, there were tons of kind of Italian ninja films and karate films. And yeah. stuff like that on the on the back of the sort of wave of ninja movies in the eighties, there or, or Star Wars knockoffs. It was just whatever. If you could see an opportunity to make some money by having a very similar looking poster on the front of your on the your know, cover on your VHS next to some of those other films in the shop, then you'd you'd make some money. So it was a great movement. It was a proper factory. You know, the, the Italian industry was an industry. There was. They were happy to be working and to just keep churning stuff out for as long as they could on whatever was required. And luckily, sometimes the films were good. It was almost like a, <laughs> almost like it wasn't I, intentional. Kind of like <laughs> even if they even if they weren't good, they were still usually fun. Yeah, oh, yeah, Cor- you know, you're right. Corman watchable, was yeah. similar. Corman would do the same thing with the, with yeah. his kind of factory that he had going. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But so Corman was a one-man uh, industry, you know, with his production companies doing this. But if you imagine the whole, like Italy's, almost their entire film industry was geared to doing what Corman was doing. So that's why there are just thousands of these kinds of movies. <laughs> it's quite overwhelming. That's why there, there are so many books and things, and you never get to the bottom of it. Are they Which, available but it just, to it's watch fun. anymore? Oh, well, a there's a lot that are, and people like Severin keep finding more of them to bring out every couple of months. Mm. Um, but for every one that you find, there's another 50 that have disappeared, <laughs> you know? <laughs> wow. Yeah. And one thing I've been doing with, with, with um, putting together lists of potential titles for our podcast is 
looking at finding things in books or on the IMDb that sound really interesting, but then trying to find any way of watching the film and they just mm-hmm. go on forever, you know. So. But then every so often, like I said, Severin will dig up some print or a, uh, a negative that's been found in some dusty vault somewhere and there you go, a film that was lost and now they've got a new Blu-ray of it. So stuff always turns up, but because there's so, there's so many films, you'll never get to the You'll never watch them all, so they, you know, there's always more, which is quite funny. Good for several. Yeah, anyway. Well, and, you know, that's the thing. They, there are just so many of these little genre movies out there, and they're, I mean, they're just, they're silly little films, but they're fun to watch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to see how they do them. I mean... I'll be honest, I think my favorite thing about Killer Crocodile, and by extension, Killer Crocodile 2, is the actual crocodile that they used to make this. Because yeah. they actually had, they built a robot crocodile, mm-hmm. and I'm just imagining some poor production assistants inside of it, in the water, trying <laughs> to make this thing work, I while, know. you know, a- Anthony Crenn is there poking it with a stick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Who is it that made it? Gianetto De Rossi? I think, Fulci's yeah, I think so. favorite makeup artist. Yeah, he was definitely involved. Yeah. And there's a guy called Paolo Ricci who yeah. was, who's credited as being the special effects guy who did, uh, in fact, he did Island of the Fishmen. I just mentioned that for a moment. Hmm. And he made, so he was good at building stuff oh, as well. he did so the construction. Yeah, I think he was involved. Um, but he did a lot of these kind of things. He did the Great Alligator as well. Yeah. So it's possible. He, he learned a lot from doing yeah. the Great Alligator, I think. <laughs> because, okay, for those who haven't seen the Great Alligator, it wasn't that great. You <laughs> never got a true sense for how big the Great Alligator was because sometimes it was like regular alligator size, sometimes it was swallowing people whole. And most of the time, they had like a little model alligator and they were just putting the camera right up next to it to make it look big. (laughs) And that's how they go. So so it keeps changing size. Yeah. And so that's part of the reason that I think, uh, I, I will give real props to killer crocodile just because they pulled the trigger and had a giant crocodile prop. Yeah. Yeah. Although it's not as giant, you look at the uh, the artwork for Killer Crocodile that's on the blue. Oh God! And it yeah. it looks like Godzilla. It's like giant. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely massive when compared to the scale of all the people it's eating. It's really funny. And and that, by the way, is also why you always, when you don't have a good budget for your movie, you want to have a painted poster. Oh yeah. Because you can put anything you want yeah. to into a painted poster. And it just sort of has to vaguely resemble things that actually happen in the movie. <laughs> and that's Killer Crocodile. That's a good example because they have this poster. And it's like Adrian said, the crocodile looks like, you know, it looks like it could swallow a Buick. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. You know. I just part, and it's, part of the trivia I have is a great alligator was filmed in... The jungles of Sri Lanka. Yep. I would not want to be in the jungles of Sri Lanka. I'm sorry. Well, okay, if we're going to go down that rabbit hole, there's a whole lot to say about the great alligator. <laughs> because I think you I should do watching. an episode on that one. <laughs> I think Maybe 500. Be there you go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's the thing. Yes. They're shooting the great alligator in Sri Lanka. They are setting the film ambiguously in the country of Africa. And I I say that because it always annoys me. Africa's a freaking continent. continent. Yeah. And everybody's just like, oh, yeah, he's over in Africa. <laughs> what? <laughs> just pick a country. Say, you know, just say it's Namibia or something. That's fine. Most people won't know where that is anyway. You're fine. But now you got to say Africa so everybody knows where you're at. But they set the film in Africa. Uh, alligators, I believe, are not native to Africa. <laughs> alligators are like an Asian one and crocodiles are 
the uh, the one from that continent. I may be mistaken, but you know I'm going to roll with that. But yeah, it, the thing that caught me with that film was that they imported a bunch of Aboriginal actors from Australia to play Africans. And that just to me was so weird. Hmm. But oh, but I'm digressing. I'm digressing. Hmm. <laughs> Cultural Sorry, sensitivity I... is not something for which the Italian genre films are known. <laughs> no, they aren't. <laughs> and I was Fiona and I were laughing so hard watching that movie about all the just little things like that. It's like, oh my god, that it's not even an alligator, that's a crocodile. Oh my god, you know. But anyway. Uh, sorry, I've difference. gone down a rabbit hole here and mm. we're gonna we're gonna crawl out of the rabbit hole that is the great alligator and jump right back into the the rabbit hole that is killer crocodile. Okay. <laughs> so are we ready to do the so, plot yet? Because I'm well, dying to hear it. Who, who did Killer Crocodile 2? Who was the director? Oh, so, okay. Uh, I've forgotten that, his okay, name. That was the special effects guy. Yeah, so Gennetta it was... De yeah, Jennifer De Rossi. And he... Um, but, I, but yeah, he's he did loads of stuff. He Again, he did zombie flesh eaters and all kinds of things. So, yeah, he um, had a lot of experience in uh, in working on these kinds of films. But didn't direct all that many films. Fearless Crocodile Hunter. I mean, he did the makeup on, um, yeah, Zombie Flesh Eaters, Cannibal Apocalypse, The Beyond, House by the Cemetery. Um, he worked on loads of great stuff. Cool. Yeah, so... Yeah, interesting. I mean, he only directed a couple of films, really. Uh, he obviously wasn't his strong suit. <laughs> well, he died. And there's a quote that says he freely admits he was a terrible director. Mm. Well, fair enough. He only died this year, didn't he? June to the Ooh. Yeah, back in April. This is a shame. But yeah, he worked on a loads of loads of cool stuff, but much better special effects than. Uh, Directing actors, I would imagine with Killer Crocodile Two, well, I haven't seen it yet, that his focus was more on directing the special effects than the people. Anyway, that would yeah, that would make sense. I would imagine. <laughs> hmm. yeah. Wasn't there a typhoon that uh, delayed production of this? Oh, was there? No, you've done more research than me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I should have watched the. There's some documentaries on the Blu-ray which I meant to watch before we spoke and then I ran out of time. Mm. But, um, yeah, that wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, obviously, they're dealing with a tropical island. You're just going to have to put up with Yeah, you, know, yeah, you just have to be ready for that with, you know, filming in the tropics. But, hey, yeah. I, what surprises me is if you had a, uh, you know, something like a typhoon come through, what surprises me is that they weren't out there catching B-roll. Yeah. You know, I would work that in. if I was oh, an Italian yeah. genre Production cinema person. Value. Yeah. yeah, I would totally work that into the movie. I'd just be like, "Oh, get the camera out there, film this." Well, that Look, that, that whole there's a, there's a lot of puddles and stuff and water just standing in the road, so that would probably <laughs> Mary, it yeah. makes sense. It, it's it's supposed to be a tropical jungle yeah. island. There's going to be puddles. Yeah. yeah. Well, you see, Nick, that's what makes you a really good film producer. You've got an eye, you know, you know what's going to bring added value. Uh, let me tell you, it's production value, buddy. You, if it yeah. happens, you film it. <laughs> yeah. That's like L Lloyd, Lloyd Kaufman's rule. When, he, when he's actually, if ever there's a fire engine, they just film it. They'll work, they'll work it into, they'll work it in later. But if he sees yes. a fire engine whizzing past, he'll make sure they film it. Whatever the film is they're making, because it adds production value. It it does, and one of my favorite things Lloyd does, if you watch a lot of his movies from the 80s and early 90s, actually all the way up through the late 90s, he has he paid for a car crash stunt <laughs> where they flip a car over at one point in one of the earlier movies, yeah. and he manages to work that into every bloody film he does for... <laughs> The same car the crash same car happens crash. in so many films. Yeah. 
but yeah, that's and yeah, I would totally been out filming the tropical storm though. But <laughs> you you, you know. see some of that actually in some of those Polizioteschi films that we just mentioned before that some of the car crashes get reused in in more than one film. Yeah, um, God love them. Because obviously, you know, they weren't expecting us to be able to watch these things at home and pause them and replay yeah. them and what you know compare them. And yeah. You'd see a film and then three years later you'd see another one. You're not going to say, "Hang on, that's the exact same car crash I saw three years ago." Yeah. It's not. They're not. Audiences were not <laughs> meant to pick up on stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. But. Yeah, that's what happens when you go down these rabbit holes of, hey, I'm going to watch all of Lloyd Kaufman's movies. Yeah. Well, you'll see the same car crash a few times. Yeah. And that's okay. No, that, um, that sounds like Corbin again. Yeah, well, it, it you oh, know what? Great. There's a certain commonality to these guys, and one <laughs> of the things is that they knew how to turn a profit on a movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you just don't waste it. Yeah, you, if you yeah exactly. It, You're right. That's like Corman paying a farmer to film them burning down his barn, which they used at the end of um, House of Usher. And then they just yep. kept reusing that same fire footage <laughs> throughout all, pretty much all of his Poe films. It's got the same bit of fire in it. Well, and I mean, okay, remember we just did Battle Beyond the Stars. And one of the things you'll see if you watch any Roger Corman sci-fi movie from about 1981 on... Half of them, I swear, have all this have at least some clips from the space fights in uh, mm-hmm. the, the space dog fighting yeah, in spaceships. Battle Beyond the Stars. <laughs> you know, but uh, but anyway, we're okay. I think yeah, I uh, okay. Uh, I, let's talk I, wait, about wait. killer. I, I what, also what? I also read that um, one of the crew members died during this production. What did they? Yeah. Oh, wow, okay. And they had a run-in with a local drug dealer. Wow, where are you getting... What is your... Where, I don't know, okay. What is your source Pietro, for this information? Pietro this is interesting. Gignardi. Who is, who is he? Was he one of the guys in the cast? G-E-N-U-A-R-D-I. He played Mark. Okay. He said he recalled... He recalls the typhoon and the death of the crew mem- member and the run-in with the drug dealer. Oh, okay. Wow, that's some... Be interesting. Well, I, you're right. He's interviewed on the disc, so that's probably what uh, he says. That's probably I just where they got her from, yeah. I haven't, I haven't watched, <laughs> watched it. Oh, now I have to. That's really I know. That, to me, would be more interesting than a movie, I think. Yeah, well, these, these things, off, often the stories behind the films are better Mark, than the films. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's another good reason to watch the extras on the yeah. Blu-ray. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. I just love that people own Blu-rays of Killer Crocodile. <laughs> yeah. Know, like, yeah. This, you I know. know. Oh, man. I know. What? what a world we live in where things like this can happen. It's wonderful. <laughs> it is wonderful, actually, Mary. You're right. <laughs> um, so, Killer okay. Crocodile. The, the composer, you... Ritz or Talani. Oh, yeah. Talani, yeah. Yeah. He did a good score, I think. On this, and he also did oh, the score for Cannibal Rizzo Holocaust. Solani. Yeah, which yeah, Riz Ortolani is one of the most prolific Italian composers. Amazing. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, um, he's done. Yeah, his stuff is well worth listening to, hmm. just on Spotify or whatever. Well, you yeah, definitely got the feeling he had watched Jaws before he scored this movie. Yeah. yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, let's face it. That dun 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 you know, that pops up quite a bit in the music oh, yeah. for this. Mm-hmm. I mean yeah, you, you certainly notice similarities between his scores. There's a particular thing that he does with some kind of electric harpsichord and you hear the same riff over and over again. Uh, yeah. I think was it didn't he do the score for Tentacles, I believe. Oh. Mm. And um, I'm sure that's that was him. Did, 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 uh, did, I mean, Tentacles is an amazing kind of Jaws ripoff as well, actually. Oh, I love um, Tentacles. Isn't that uh, is it Shelley Winters in that? Yeah. So yes. That, yeah. Oh I'm my sure God, it's... that's yeah, Shelley Winters. There's just. She showed up in so many weird movies, but uh, 
Yeah, no, Tentacles is um, that's a great film as well. <laughs> Anyway, again, we keep talking about other films and not this one. <laughs> so, well, but yeah, Rizal okay. Talani is uh, he's great. His music is always fun. Oh no, I'm getting it. I'm getting him mixed up with Stelvio Cipriani. I do apologise. Stelvio Cipriani did Tentacles. Um, I get. I tend to get Rizal Talani, Stelvio Cipriani, and Piero Umilani uh, all confused together because they all did loads of cult Italian film soundtracks. So it's quite easy to mix those guys up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Rizzle Time is very good. I think he did some Barber films, but again, I could just be mixing up one of the other guys. <laughs> and, I, and I have to give kudos to the cinematographer, I, Federico Del Zappo. Mm-hmm. I think he did a wonderful job on this movie. Mm-hmm. I, Aren't I we love watching that. the same movie, Mary? I, I really <laughs> liked this movie. I, it, was, it, it surprised me that I liked it. Yeah. He did a great job if you think about the sort of relatively primitive conditions he was working under. Yeah. That's so true. He, he did. Even just to get you his know. camera working in all that humidity was probably <laughs> challenging at times. Yeah, you know what it's like when you take a camera from the inside and yeah. then go outside and it just fogs just, up completely. Yeah. Getting shots that are in focus was an achievement. Mm hmm. <laughs> anyway. Oh. And, it? you know, this movie did violate the never work with children or animals thing. Oh, don't mm-hmm. bring that up. Although. Why did they have to do that? What? To, the, that the crocodile, the crocodile eat some children. No, I didn't care about the kids getting eaten. It was the dog. I knew it. I knew <laughs> you were going to say that, Mary. And I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to have it come out of your mouth that, okay, whatever, they ate a bunch of kids, ter- yeah, tragic. No big deal. Uh, but, but they the ate a dog. dog. <laughs> well, don't forget that in Jaws, a dog gets eaten as well. So a dog yeah, and a child yeah, but, get oh. eaten at the same time in the same scene. So uh, it seems it's quite in, in keeping with Jaws that they would do that. Okay. And actually, they didn't kill any kids in this. That was the thing. Yeah, they did. <laughs> if I remember right, the Try, scene where the little they? girl was being threatened, like eight or ten people got eaten trying to save her oh, yeah. because <laughs> none of them could figure out that they just needed to grab her and pull her up. They yeah, kept getting didn't... into the water to try and yeah. push her yeah. up. Why didn't they have... run up the dock and get her? I didn't understand. Because they, uh, they're in a film. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> You make because this film requires people to get eaten, otherwise there's no point. <laughs> yeah. So they all had to lower themselves into the jaws of a crocodile in the name of entertainment. Wait, did yeah. he kill a little boy at the very beginning, right before that she fell in the water? Didn't he fall in the water and get eaten? Uh, you're thinking of, um, you're think, at the start of the movie, Mary? Well, right before the dock fell in, right when the, there was the kids playing on the dock and... Oh, I think so. Do- yeah, maybe. I don't think the they ate one of the kids. Oh, okay. I lost track. Okay, know, there were 21 ate... people killed in this movie. Oh, wow. And I yes, I have a I have a head count. <laughs> and I don't believe that any of them were children. Oh, okay. And by the way, when I say t- 21 killed on screen, not not like, okay, we're mowing down the cast and crew here, <laughs> uh, despite what may be on the Blu-ray's documentary. Yeah. So One off screen and 21 on screen. There you go. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's. Uh, is there anybody else associated with the film we want to talk about? Or we want to, because I think Adrian's dying to hear me talk about I know. <laughs> the plot. I just yeah, have to say, I'm really a... glad that they, the head of the Foley corporation got killed got eaten i hated that man yeah, wow you funny. you actually paid attention to the name of the company yeah because i don't even remember the name of the company and i've seen this movie like five times wow. <laughs> hmm. i guess it jumped on at me because you know folly and the oh cinem- okay cinema graphic cinema never mind <laughs> I know what you're saying, because of Foley, which, yes. which is the yes. term for doing sound yes. work. Yes, thank you, thank you. Not cinematography, yeah. but okay. <laughs> That's what it was. That's probably why it stuck in my head. Okay, fair he enough. Was, he was an evil creature. I didn't like him at all. I was glad he got eaten. 
Okay. <laughs> Sounds to me, Mary, like you didn't care about anybody that got eaten as long as they weren't a dog. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. That yeah. was crossing the line, but yeah. okay, it is a sad thing when you're sitting there rooting for the crocodile to eat the environmentalists. Well, they were such, I'm sorry, dicks, you know. We can't kill a crocodile. It might be the species, blah, blah, blah. In the meantime, they know that there's radioactive waste everywhere, and, you know, it's not a new species. I don't know. They just well, so annoyed it, me. Okay, that, maybe that brings us around to what we were talking about at the beginning. So how, which is more likely, <laughs> a new species of crocodile or that nuclear waste has made a crocodile get really big? How are those two, scientifically... Which one is more likely to be true? <laughs> nuclear waste. <laughs> so can, can nuclear waste make things bigger? Because I, I always thought that was just the movies. Uh, yeah, I, I think it is. I think, Mary, that nuclear waste, and you should know this, just gives you cancer. It, it will change your cell structure. Right, yeah, but in a way that makes you big cancer. and strong. Yeah, so it's mostly cancer, but, you know, there are other mutations that happen but yeah really? uh, i've never seen it documented that it made large creatures let me put it that way <laughs> like the colossal man or something yeah, like that. Exactly. yeah i was gonna or say the 50, I the 50 foot the woman, I woman. Exactly. disagree with you mary <laughs> Hello? i mean look, oh, look God's, godzilla is supposed to be because of radiation that's true yeah yeah, okay, um, Tokyo would disagree with you, Mary. Do you know how many yeah. times he stomped through Tokyo? <laughs> so for, the, for these environmentalists, should, it have, should they have assumed it was the radiation, or could they have thought maybe there is a new species? Like, I don't know. I, just think. I think the key point there is what you just said, thought. Mm-hmm. I don't think they thought Why? about anything well, ever. Well, you know, when they jumped into the water with that suit on, knowing that it was radioactive, and they didn't think. You know, okay. I mean, he had so okay. much internal contamination from drinking the water, all of them, that <laughs> I don't... <laughs> They're okay. going to have problems in the future. The so if they, if they didn't get eaten by the alligator, I, I don't think they'd have long lifespans anyway. Mm-hmm. That is very possible yeah. because, <laughs> yeah, God bless. Yeah. So, okay. And they camped right next to the nuclear waste. Too, yeah, so that I, was they, like, there were really? a lot of, there were a lot of uh, not wise decisions yeah. being made in this film. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So we got Killer Crocodile. Yes. Now, now bearing in mind, this was 1989. So it was a Jaws ripoff, but we're talking, you know, 14, 15 years after Jaws came out. So, mm-hmm. and I guess they got tired of making Killer Shark movies or Giant Killer Fish movies. So they went to the Giant Killer Crocodile film genre, which... You know, good for them, because whatever you have to say about this movie, they did make, they built a giant crocodile for it. Yay! Okay, yay, Mm -hmm. and I'm totally on board with that, and it also explains to me, at least, why they filmed Killer Crocodile 2 back-to-back with this. And that's because I can literally see the guys, the producers, in a room smoking cigars going, hey, we uh, paid for this uh, killer crocodile prop. You think it'll last for two movies? Yeah. Yeah. Let's make a scene. They can can offset some of the costs from the first film onto the budget for the second one to, to help make the first one look like it made more of a profit. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's that's the kind of brilliant filmmaking that I just <laughs> wish was still going on more today. You know, we built this crocodile. Let's film it until it falls apart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and do it uh, fast because if it's a year later, it might deteriorate too badly. Yeah. yeah. And they did do it fast. I mean, they literally wrapped production on one and just started up on the other. <laughs> so. But, okay, so what you got, uh, it's set down in the Dominican Republic, and I think we've kind of hit this, but I'll go ahead and mention it. What is the best way to 
you, what's the best MacGuffin for making a giant monster in a movie? Why that would be nuclear waste or nuclear power. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, somebody – and okay, can I ask you this question? How many nuclear power plants are down in the Dominican Republic? <laughs> Because it kind of occurred to me they've got this nuclear waste, right? And they're just shipping that, it from other places because yeah, I, it's I got cheap. the impression that it was an American, and he's yeah. obviously he just, just got some kind of secret contract. He's got some yeah. contracts, and he's getting paid loads of money to get rid of this stuff. Yeah, and okay. He, and he found see, a cheap way to do it. Yeah, so you can kind of you can see this film as um, as almost like a satire on uh, you know criticizing America and the way that America treats the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. We've got this stuff, let's just dump it somewhere. It doesn't matter where it is as long as it's not America. Yeah. <laughs> that actually I'm sure sounds... that isn't true and that never happens. Let me just say that. Oh, I'm sure that <laughs> never I'm sure happens. that this is never actually something that Americans would really do. Oh no. We never we don't we didn't up until two or three years ago ship most all of our plastic waste to China. So hmm. that they could deal with it. No, we stick, never do that. They could stick it in their rivers and stuff. You know, and the funny thing about that is that's perfectly legal. Mm-hmm. It's like literally there's an industry for just shipping garbage to other countries. And we're all good with that. I, th- that just mm-hmm. boggles my mind. But anyway, um, so yeah, the film opens up and you've got these environmentalists. And they're running around in the Dominican, I guess, the the Amazon forests or whatever in the Dominican Republic. And, well, they've got a boat. <laughs> and first of all, none of them seem like what I would qualify as people that should be alone out in the middle of the, the swamps in the Dominican Republic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and they're they're tooting along in their boat, well, and they, they find a, they had some that girl. She was oh, wait, a wait, local, wait. Remember, which one? What? Who? Huh? The local girl. Oh yeah, they had, a, they had a guide. Eaten. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the she was. She's that's right. She guide. was their guide. But yeah. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself though. Oh. Because remember, Killer Crocodile, like any good killer monster movie, starts with some people being eaten. Yeah. Yes. And what you got is this uh, young couple who are out being romantic near the water side. And, well, she you know, was, this guy. He wasn't. Well, no, he was kind of like, hey, listen to my new song. Yeah. And he plays this <laughs> song for her. And then she's like, wow, I'm going to go take a swim now because that was the least romantic thing ever. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, okay, whatever, lady. And so his girlfriend goes and hops in the water and starts swimming. Well, that's maybe not the best idea in the world because, of course, there's a killer crocodile nearby. And so it starts eating her, and he's like, oh, my God, I've got to save her. So he jumps in the water, which is probably the – it's what you would do, but at the same time, that is possibly the worst thing that he could do (laughs) because he's just – it's like, ah – it's delivery food now. He does the crocodile doesn't even have to go out of the water for it. It's just like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna get it. But anyway, uh you know, and this is when after all the delightful uh serenading guitar music, now we get into the Jaws ripoff music with the killer crocodile. And you know, it's a it, it, it's fun, and that's when the the giant words "killer crocodile" come flying at you out of the you know out of the out of the swamps, and we then you know we cut to this boatload of environmental researchers led by Kevin, and Kevin is uh, Anthony Crenna, by the way, who is as we mentioned the son of actor Richard Crenna. By the way, spoiler alert: if you have not watched Killer Crocodile at this point, you're probably better off. But oh, oh no! I, I, I'm just saying it's it's much better than the Great Alligator. But anyway, go and watch Killer Crocodile, and then come back to the podcast because we've thrown out a lot of the things that happen in this. But I'm going to spoil the hell out of it here. Mm-hmm. So anyway, this boatload of environmentalists. <laughs> they're just chugging down the river, just randomly looking for pollution. Which, okay, 
I'm not sure why they're there looking for pollution, but fortunately for them, they find it. Now, they are, and they are really, what's the best way to put this? Really not smart. So they come across a bunch of drums that are obviously leaking chemicals, right? They pull the boat up to them, and then it's like, okay, you need to get in there and go investigate it. And so they put the guy in what essentially looks like a discount hazmat suit. But but my favorite part, they slap some welding goggles on him, and they slap a breather over his mouth. But his face is still exposed, Mm -hmm. and the hood around it is, like, open. It's like it's going to catch the radiation and focus it on his brain. (laughs) And the guy gets in the water and goes right up to the uh, nuclear waste, and he's got a voltage meter in his hand. And according to the voltage meter, the uh, the, the, uh, nuclear waste is giving off about 18 volts. And I guess that's enough to power his voltage meter because he's like, ooh, this is dangerous. And Anthony Crenn is like, yeah, man, get out of the water. You've been exposed enough. Okay, they have all taken a lethal dose of radiation at this point. (laughs) If they're that close to it, oh, come on. But anyway, so the voltage meter says that it's radiation. I think they took a couple of pictures They didn't even bother to mark on a map where it was, but they are going to blow the lid off this environmental disaster now. And so they they decide to camp right next to the environmental disaster. (laughs) And, you know, they brought a little yappy dog. And the little yappy dog goes wandering off into the jungle to be a yappy dog. And we hear the classic yelp. And that's kind of it. The crocodiles had a snack. But the lady who's their local guide, she goes after the dog because she's like, oh, no, my dog has disappeared. Why do you bring your dog into the jungle without a leash anyway? It's going to run off, and it's a bloody jungle. I mean, there's forget killer crocodiles. They're just regular crocodiles would love to eat your dog. But anyway, um, so she goes out looking for it, and sure enough, the crocodile finds her, and she becomes the next snack for the crocodile. So the next morning, this is one of my favorite bits, the group notices that one of their members is gone. First of all, they don't really even worry about the dog, so not good environmentalists. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they decide after looking for her for about five minutes that, yeah, we better just leave. I know. Yeah, those are the worst friends ever. I mean, it's just like, oh, God, she's gone. She could be anywhere. She could be hurt. Let's leave. Okay. And so they go to town, and they're going to try and find the police or some authorities to uh, to organize a search. And what they find is the judge, and that's Van Johnson. And the judge doesn't like that they've been snooping around looking for pollution. So he basically tells them to get lost. He's like, I'm not going to help you. And so the Scooby gang gets back in their boat and heads back out on the river to look for their friend. Uh, and they end up kind of near where they camped before, and they they run the boat aground on a, on a bunch of logs and get into the water to push it loose, which I'm not sure that's the best plan either. But as they're trying to get it loose, uh, they find the lady's body. And, you know, she kind of pops up like a jack-in-the-box out of the weeds. Mm-hmm. It's pretty, you know, it's like, whoa, spring-loaded body. And can I just say this? What is up with the crocodile? Because he never finishes a meal. I know. It's, it's like, like he chews hungry. these people up and then spits them out because, uh, you know, too many preservatives or whatever. I guess he only wants, you know, organic victims. And these people were not organic enough for him, despite being a bunch of hippies. But anyway, so they take her body back to town. And... This is kind of one of the things that I thought was funny in the film, but it would actually probably be the case. They take her and put her into like an ice house. That's a a slaughterhouse. What? Fish market. 
Yeah, it's a fish market, yeah. and and it's like the ice house for keeping the fish cold, and they take her body in there so that the doctor can look at her and say, uh, yeah, she's dead. <laughs> you know, oh, okay. <laughs> and, you know, the judge It takes is years like, of yeah. medical training to be able to make that kind of diagnosis. Yeah, Definitely. and my favorite part, though, is that the judge, he's in on it with this guy Foley, and their deal is that they're bringing nuclear waste down here and dumping it. And Foley's apparently paying the judge off. So the judge is trying to get these environmentalists to go away because he's afraid that somebody's going to discover that he's been allowing them to dump nuclear waste out in the, out in the bayou or whatever near the town. So he actually starts trying to accuse them of having murdered their own friend. Mm-hmm. And that is the thinnest... <laughs> It's like, really? How did they murder her? Did they chew her, take turns chewing on her and spitting her out? I mean, good Lord. But anyway, so they get back to town. The judge is very unhelpful. Um, but they do run into this guy, Joe. And Joe is, for lack of a better word, this film's Quint. Mm-hmm. Okay. So he's the grizzled old hunter who's out, and he's going to get this shark, or this shark, he's going to get this crocodile. (laughs) And, okay, he carries a 12-gauge shotgun throughout the movie, but he wears a bandolier of 50 caliber bullets. And that bugged me more than anything, because I'm like, why does he have the bandolier of bullets? He's using a shotgun. You know, at least just have it be a bandolier of shotgun shells. But no, they had a bandolier of fifty caliber bullets laying around in costuming, so that's what they gave him. <laughs> uh, I anyway. would never have noticed that. Yeah, yeah I well, didn't and I don't know why, but that just really stuck out to me this time when I was watching it. So, you know, it's like, why is he carrying those bullets around? They don't even fit his gun. But anyway... um, so he decides he's going to kill the crocodile. And the environmentalists are all like, no, you can't kill the crocodile. It's a rare species. We need to capture it, man. And so they uh, get in their boat and go off and proceed to have a whole bunch of environmental accidents, as it were, as they're trying to roam up and down the river looking for this crocodile with a great plan to save it. Which is, they had no plan at all. I don't know what they were trying to do, but other yeah, than... What they, when themselves... they catch it, where are they going to put it? Where are they going to put it? What are they going to do? How are they going to catch it? Yeah. I mean, these guys make the Scooby gang look like a well-prepared, you know, mm-hmm. Navy SEALs team. Yeah. You know, they're just out there in their little boat putting around. And, I mean, it's... Uh, and. What was the deal? They were all sleeping in the same tent at one point, too. Because one of them gets up and goes out of the tent at night. And, of course, the crocodile is there watching them because the crocodile's more intelligent than anybody else in this movie. <laughs> and, you know, the kids, uh, they're like, oh, the guys are like, oh, quick, get in the boat. Why are you getting in the boat? That's just asking for trouble from the crocodile. And the crocodile smashes the boat and mostly sinks it, but not quite. And he ends up eating one of the environmentalists. Well, now the environmentalists are mad. So they end up... uh, Richard Crenna's kid, Anthony Crenna, goes full-on psycho because, like, Five minutes before, he was like, we have to save the crocodile. And now he's like, I am going to kill this crocodile yeah. if it is the last thing I ever do. Dun, yes. dun, dun. So they are just the crappiest environmentalists ever. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. But anyway, when they're done being human snacks, they they are rescued by Joe. And he gets them back to his, uh, the survivors because they've been, you know, this thing's eaten like three of them at this point, I think. <laughs> you know, it's just picking off environmentalists. And that's the thing. You eat one environmentalist, you're just going to be hungry for another one in a half hour. Mm. I mean, it's terrible. But, oh, and I forgot, the killer crocodile shows up in town and knocks a dock into the water. And that's when this little girl is... She's precariously hanging from the dock, 
And she's got every, good upper arm strength. <laughs> yeah, she's she got hangs on there for hours. Because she hangs there for like ten minutes while the crocodile mm. literally eats everybody in the town. <laughs> because everybody in the town is jumping into the water to try and push her up the dock. Because apparently she weighs... I don't know, maybe she's made out of dark matter or something. Yeah. Because she can't weigh more than 20 pounds, it looks like. But at the same time, nobody can pull her up. They have to get in the water and push to mm-hmm. get her out of the water. So the crocodile eats three or four townspeople, and finally Joe shows up and drives it off. And, you know, of course, Richard Krenna's kid, and I keep calling him Richard Krenna's kid because I honestly just can't think of him as a human not... Richard Crenna's son. Just he's he's a human on his own, but for some reason that's all I can think of. But you know, he jumps in the water too, but he doesn't get eaten because he's the quote unquote star. Mm-hmm. So, you know, which by the way, Anthony Crenna is the star of your film. <laughs> Just let that sink in a little bit. Okay. So anyway, they save the girl, they go and Anthony Crenn is like, I'm going to go with you to hunt this crocodile, Joe. And Joe's like, kid, you're going to get yourself killed. Here, let's go. And so they go out hunting for the crocodile. And, and they leave, leave all the girls in, alone in the, in the shack. Don't they? And yeah, he's, leaving the girls and, he's, and one guy alone. Oh, yeah. And the shack is really quite... I mean, like, if Joe, Joe is kind of the cool guy here, but then you see where he lives... And you realize, actually, he's just kind of some eccentric homeless guy that's, uh, that yes, they've, accidentally, they've accidentally teamed up with the local nut job. Mm-hmm. Well, he's the, the local homeless guy, but he has his shotgun. And the alligator mm. already and with no, made a big no hole bullets. in his house. <laughs> that one wall well, was that, missing because the alligator went in there. Yeah. Yeah. It, and what was the deal there? What did the alligator, did he and the alligator have some sort of vendetta? <laughs> because he was just like, ah, the damn alligator's done ate half my house. Urgh. And he's just well, he, very... he had it round for a nice fondue evening and <laughs> things got a bit out of hand. A few, game, a few games of cards, yeah. words were spoken. Some cheating was done. Yeah. Before you knew it, the crocodile had wagged his tail a bit too enthusiastically and this shack that he lives in is basically made out of paper. Just couldn't handle it. <laughs> and why did they all sleep on the bottom floor of the shack? I mean, it's already got a hole in it because of the alligator, the crocodile. Why wouldn't they at least gone up to the second floor? That I didn't get either. Maybe it was even more dodgy upstairs, and that oh. it would have just collapsed if the if the weight of all these people. Okay. Because <laughs> it's such a rubbish house. <laughs> Yeah. The prop, the prop guys built this set for them, but he said, "Look, don't go, anyone go up the stairs because I don't think they'll, I don't I'd, think they'll hold. It'll just collapse. <laughs> don't, don't do it. Film everybody. I don't, I don't care if it looks weird. Everyone's got to stay downstairs. <laughs> they probably had a conversation like that. Yeah, I believe it. Now, I was in a play once. I was in a show. It was a version of Annie Get Your Gun, and the production company had hired." They'd rented a set, like a professional set, for a scene on a train. And there was a set of um, bunk beds in this this set. And I was one of the kids. And so I was on the top bunk. And there was some, and my, one of my, a girl playing my sister was on the bottom bunk. And we're all singing a song. And this was in the final dress rehearsal. And halfway through the song that we were singing, this bunk bed thing just collapsed. Oh. And I went down and landed on top of the girl underneath, and it broke her arm. Wow. Um, yeah. Oh. Um, and it turned out that this set that they'd hired was purely for backdrop only. It wasn't supposed to have anybody in these beds. They weren't made to be used. They were just made to be in the background, and they were basically held together with one flimsy piece of wood holding the top bunk up. Oops. And so... <laughs> And this poor girl had to do the whole show for the rest of the week with her arm in a cast. Oh. Um, she was okay about that, I think. But anyway, so that just you know, it's possibly a similar thing here that they built the set <laughs> to look okay, but it was not built for humans to that's true. go anywhere up it. So mm. that's my theory. 
Yeah, no, I think you're spot on there. And <laughs> there were a lot of times in this movie where I was thinking, you know, there were actors in what I would classify as real jeopardy during filming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, oh, man. I mean, just every time they got in that water, all I could think of was, wow, I wonder how if they are all just getting dysentery right now. Mm-hmm. But, you know, good on them, though, for being troopers. Um so, okay, so the environmentalist Kevin, uh, Richard Crenna's kid, has, has teamed up with Joe, the eccentric discount homeless guy version of Quint, and uh, they go tooting down the river on his boat looking for the crocodile. Meanwhile, Van Johnson and the uh, evil head of the company, Foley, have gone out on their boat to get rid of the nuclear waste so that these environmentalists can't find it. And when they get out there, that Foley just totally tosses a, a judge into the water, and so Van Johnson gets eaten by the crocodile. But then the best scene in the movie, I think, is when the crocodile rears up out of the water and just smacks Foley right into the water because it's yeah. just so oh, no. cheesy. But so Foley gets his comeuppance. But again, I, I cheered. Uh, they, what? I cheered. I was happy. Well, I cheered too. And the thing is, this crocodile, as I said, is not a good a good crocodile mm-hmm. because he doesn't eat his food. He just chews people up and then spits them out so they can be found later. Yeah. Yeah, so lazy crocodile, you know, only only bite off what you're going to eat. That's that's the word, you know, that's the rule. Come on, crocodile, mm-hmm. get with the program. But anyway, so so Richard Crenna's kid and Joe, uh, Discount Quint, are chasing after the crocodile, and Discount Quint is yelling at the crocodile, hey, come out, I'll get you, and the crocodile obliges. And the crocodile swims right up to him, and he's just shooting it with the 12-gauge, and it's having no effect. And that's really disappointing because he had intimidated the local ammunition guy into making exploding bullets for him, apparently. Yeah. And they did absolutely nothing. So that was this whole thing, I've got these special bullets now, and I'll pay you for these later. Oh, my God, Adrian, you're right. He was a homeless guy. (laughs) <laughs> that that really just sank in because he never paid even for his bullets. He's like, put them on my tab. What tab? You're homeless. You're just terrifying all these people. Oh, my God. Well, anyway, so Homeless Joe uh, ends up falling in the water, and about 800 gallons of blood bubbles to the surface mm-hmm. after he's fallen in the water. And so, of course, you know, Kevin thinks, oh, my God, I've lost discount Quint. What am I going to do? I'll just take the boat back and go get the guys. Well, on his way back, he picks them up, and they're like, let's make explosives out of these. We'll make Molotov cocktails and go after the, uh, go after the killer crocodile with this rocket launcher and stuff. Uh, so what is going on in this movie? So anyway, they go back out after the crocodile. And it's about to kill him, and then all of a sudden, half-eaten Joe just pops <laughs> up out of nowhere and tosses his hat to Kevin, and he's just like, here, you're going to need this for luck. No, he needs a freaking rocket launcher is what he <laughs> needs. And, yeah, so they – and I don't even remember what it was exactly he threw in the crocodile's mouth, but it was explosive. And so they managed to blow up not the crocodile prop. And I say they don't blow up the crocodile prop because it, you know, it cuts away and it's just an explosion. And I think uh, they definitely did not want to destroy their fancy crocodile because they Mm -hmm. had another movie to shoot. So Mm -hmm. why was Joe alive? Speculation? He was he was also needed for the sequel. <laughs> there you go. He was needed for the sequel. Van Johnson, they only paid to be around for two or three days. Yeah. So yeah. he, you know, they could get rid of him. But Joe, that guy, he's going to be around. And, mm-hmm. yeah, this was, this was, okay, I really enjoy <laughs> this film. That's the thing. It is so much fun to watch, but yeah. because it's so terrible... They are so stupid. 
the environmentalists, it's like when you are sitting there rooting for for the environmentalists to get eaten, you know that you're doing something wrong in life. <laughs> so, and But it was just so much fun to root for them to get eaten. I know. And the... I feel like the crocodile was doing a public service and getting rid of as many of them as possible because it was environmentalists like these in the 80s that are the reason we have global warming now. <laughs> okay? So I feel like this entire movie was a metaphor for oh. global warming. Oh. I'm sorry for you, Nick. <laughs> well, you, you did a great a great job then. Thank you. I, I, and... By the way, there was a sequel to this film, and it's pretty much the same film, but with a better-looking cast. Mm. Hmm. Well, I'm going to watch it. Yeah. yeah. Well, the okay, the sequel, okay, among other things, the sequel has nudity. Ah. Uh. Yeah, Richard Crenna's kid's butt. Oh, okay, that might be worth it. Oh, oh all of a sudden, Mary's <laughs> like, I want to watch this. <laughs> Get me some Richard Crenna Jr. Wow. 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 Uh, so, so you liked the movie too, Mary? Right? I did. I Good. liked the I liked the cinematography of it. Was I, it German I, expressionism no. at its best, Mary? <laughs> no, I just liked how gritty it was. It it really made me feel like they were actually in a jungle in a little village and. Mm. And those were real people. Um, Mary, that's because they, they shot were. this in a jungle <laughs> in a little village with real people. I mean, okay, there's a part when the environmentalists come to town and they go up to a couple of people and ask them for directions to the police. Mm -hmm. And I swear to God, I think they just put a camera down at the end of the street yeah. and filmed them going up to a couple of people and asking them where the police are. Yeah. And, and the people said, there's no police, there's a judge. And then the director's like, brilliant, that's the character for Van Johnson. Wick. Mm -hmm. He's the judge now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just, I really but, enjoyed that part. Well, it was it was very gritty, Mary, because it had no money yeah. to not be gritty. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's and well, a lot uh, of the a lot of these kinds of films were shot in interesting locations. Like you mentioned Sri Lanka before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and and I think Cannibal Holocaust. I think they went to Brazil. I think. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so they would they much. would go to different countries to do these things, but then you get some other films. There are cannibal films, for example, where they just filmed them in a park in Rome and <laughs> hired hired some local Filipino students to come in and play the natives. So you also yeah. get that. You get like both extremes yeah. with these kinds of films. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I have to say this was the best Jaws ripoff that I watched the last week. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's something. Yeah. And uh, by the way, you know, I keep calling this uh, Joe guy, you know, he was discount Quint. But what I really felt like was they wanted to get Lee Van Cleef to come in and do this movie. Mm. And Lee Van Cleef had just died like the year before they made this. Mm. And so they couldn't get Lee Van Cleef. And, and you can't tell me I love Lee Van Cleef to death. Love him to death. He's one of my favorite actors in the Spaghetti Westerns. Mm -hmm. He could do no wrong. Mm -hmm. But he was just hot off of Master Ninja, the TV series. And it was not a great TV series in the 80s. Mm -hmm. I know they could have got him for at least as cheaply as they got Richard Crenna's kid. <laughs> So, yeah, it's just a shame he died or that discount Quint would have probably been Lee Van Cleef. And I say like that. Him. I say that yeah. because the dude that they got was kind of like the discount Lee Van Cleef mm -hmm. is how he yeah. looked. You know, he was constantly yeah. trying to do that squinty eyed thing. <laughs> yeah. And if you look at the look at other films that Ennio Girolami was in, he was in. Things like the Bronx Warriors and stuff like that. He he, and he did loads of westerns. So you yeah you're right. He's kind of the Italian um, Lee, Lee Van Cleef. Yeah, definitely. Ah, uh, Lee Van Cleef. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm in my happy yeah. Van Cleef place now, yeah. so no, you can't. So there you, you go, stop. Killer Crocodile. Thank, yeah. thank Killer you crocodile. For, for watching it, for agreeing to do that with me. Thank you for suggesting I, it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when you suggested this movie, I was like, ah, we're going to do Killer Crocodile. <laughs> I was like, well, if, I was, if Nick had suggested it, I probably would have said no, but it was <laughs> you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. I trust I, you. Mary, <laughs> you, yes, break, you break you my heart, Mary. <laughs> Mary's no, like, yeah, it. I'll yeah. break whatever I can get mm-hmm. hold of, man. Yeah. I You're did, going I did down. Enjoy it. I really did. Good. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't real gory. No. I don't know. No. Maybe if I'd watched it back then, it would have been gory, but... Yeah, it could have been worse. Yeah, I was going to say an episode of CSI is worse than exactly. this movie by yeah. far. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay. okay, well, are we ready to get on with the uh, feedback? Oh, we got uh, some feedback. Yes, we I'm. Have. I'm going to have to step out at this point. I'm afraid it was um, my son's birthday this weekend, and they're, uh, oh. they're, they're waiting for me to come and do some stuff. Cool. Oh, well, happy birthday yes. Ad- or to yeah. Adrian's son. How old yeah. is he? I mean, he's 17. He's getting on there. Whoa. Oh, wow. Well, Who's congratulations. The one that went to the library with us when we were over there? Oh, that was Oscar. He is now 15. Wow. I know. I think he was only about six when we did that. I know, yeah. <laughs> well, wish him happy but, yeah. birthday from us. Yeah, happy Thank birthday. You. I will. And thank but you yeah, for thank coming. you so much. It's been really fun to uh, to to go over this film in such such detail. I think it's very. <laughs> I'm impressed at all your research, both of you, much better than what I did. <laughs> well, I just feel like we put more thought into the film than they put into it making Probably. it. Probably that's true. But we that's certainly spent we, we've spent longer talking about it than the than the film is. You know, oh, we always do sure. that. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. There's all these little rabbit holes to go down to. And all the yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know why you guys don't get commissioned to do audio commentaries. <laughs> because that's exactly why. You'd have to watch the film three times to get the audio commentary in by the time we were done with it. <laughs> hey, well, thanks again for being yeah. on the show, Adrian. Yeah. No, no, thank you. I really appreciate Great it. Here. I'm looking forward to listening back to it. Looking forward to it. Hey having you on the show again thank you yeah. i'm just gonna shall i just end the call is that not gonna is that not gonna mess up your recording i think that'll be that'll perfect be yeah. okay bye, thanks Adrian. and thanks everybody bye hey ciao <laughs> see i said ciao because we didn't yeah, yeah. Italian. We did. okay. so give us some feedback mary Okay, our first feedback is from Peter Stima, and he says, Hi, Mary, Forbidden World 1982. Looks like summer is winding down. And I had to I had to say that just because it's cold down here. It's gone down into the 60s at night. And everybody's oh my walking God, with jackets Mary. on, and we're freezing. It won't last long. I think tomorrow it's going to go back up, but it's cold down here. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary. I know. I know. Oh, well, I've been in the South too long, I think. I was going to say, you've definitely been in the South too, too long, long if you <laughs> think the 60s is cold. But, okay, carry on. Okay, this next one is from Marlo Brown. It says, Hi, Mary Nick Wan and the gang at the B-Movie Cast Clubhouse. I'm sure the contest answer is Forbidden World from 1982. I loved the Battle Beyond the Stars episode. I saw the movie back when it came to my local cinema in Santa Rosa, California. Alan Holtzman was an amazing guest. Yes, he was. It was so great to listen to a veteran filmmaker talk about his craft and about working with Roger Corman. I managed to finally, after many, many months, actually go to the movies. I saw The Suicide Squad, and it was exactly what I wanted to see. Uh, I've been an Idris Elba fan for a long time. Me too, I love him. Um, Though it was also cool to try to spot the smaller roles with big names behind them, like Nathan Fillion. I enjoyed it. Maybe not high art, but a vast improvement over the first movie with a very similar name. I liked that first movie. I I thought the first movie was okay, but this one was way better, number one. I haven't seen it. Number two... 
Nathan Fillion does have a very small role in it, and that was James Gunn. I love James Gunn, and I've been a fan of him since he did uh, Tromeo and Juliet with Lloyd Kaufman back wow. in the 90s. Wow. And, yeah, exactly, and that's the thing. If you watch a lot of his movies, Lloyd actually pops up in a cameo, <laughs> and he pops up in this one, too. Mm. Um, but the other thing is he brought in a bunch of people – like decent named actors uh, that he had worked with over the years, including Nathan Fillion, to play little roles in the Suicide Squad. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to go too much into it because that would be telling. But <laughs> um, one of the things that I thought was hilarious, and you can look this up, apparently Edmonton up in Canada is trying to – okay. Nathan Fillion's apparently from Edmonton, and they're trying to honor him. They are going to name a building after Nathan Fillion. Wow. And are you ready for what the building is? What? The Nathan Fillion Civilian Pavilion. Whew. So Google that, folks. It's a thing. Wow. <laughs> so there you go. The Nathan Fillion Civilian Pavilion. And I... And I dare you to say that five times fast <laughs> when was the first suicide squad uh that was like 2016 okay and that was just suicide squad this film is the suicide squad oh okay see that the makes all the difference yeah it does definitely and i'm going to say this was the best film i I've ever seen with a giant killer starfish. Hmm. I've got to see that. Yeah, you do need to see it, Mary. It's a fun movie. Yeah. Is Harley Quinn in it? Yes, she is. Okay. She almost has a... It's almost like another Harley Quinn movie kind of shoehorned into this, actually. Oh, good. Because she goes off on her own for a while and, and has like this... Adventure. This whole movie within a movie, almost. Wow. You know? Good. Okay, but I'm going to warn you. What? Okay, there's a lot of toilet humor in this, and it's got a lot of gore. Oh. James okay. Gunn is not shy about the gore. Okay. It definitely earns its R rating. Let's put it that way. Hmm. Okay. So, so anyway, Might check be it worth out. I'd just see Harley Quinn again. Well, there I you go. I like her. She's crazy. Completely well, yes. crazy. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Let's get on with this uh, this feedback here from Marlon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes on to say, I caught Shadow in the Clouds on DVD, and I can't recommend it. The main problem is the script with Chloe Grace Moretz's character being a total Mary Sue who does everything perfectly the first time she tries it. It took me completely out of the story. I was disappointed as I loved the premise and wanted to like the film. I haven't even heard of that one. Okay, I've actually seen it, mm -hmm. and I can totally get what his problem with it was. I enjoyed the film, mm -hmm. but you do have to overlook a lot of, hey, I'm just really good at everything I do. Okay. And... Yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a what if there was a real what if gremlins were real and they were on an airplane in during World War II. Oh. And and it and but it's there's a lot more to it than that and at the same time there's not. <laughs> okay. So so okay. there you go. Okay. Uh, he goes on to say, finally, for any B-movie fans looking for free genre movies, Redbox.com has a free collection of films available to, screen, to stream. Wow, I didn't know they did that. I didn't either. Uh, go to their website, scroll down the bottom, and look for the free on-demand link. I recently found several good choices like Django Unchained, Battle Royale, and even Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Oh, wow. Uh, they rotate the films periodically, so there's almost always something there that looks interesting. Cool. Good. Another Very cool. Get, watch some free movies. Good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, because we don't have enough movies to oh, watch. Tell me about it. Uh, 
Okay, he goes on to say, thanks for everything. Bye, Mary. Marlo, making Texas safer one chupacabra at a time. Or maybe they're just squirrels. <laughs> Oh, oh! Well, you know how I hate squirrels, so I do. Yeah, so I, I, I or squirrels, either one, I'm fine with it. <laughs> okay, and carrying for, on, Mary. And, and what for those that don't know me, I have squirrels everywhere. It, 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 I have a neighbor that shoots them, and it seems like you shoot one, and like three more pop up from somewhere. It's like you know, it's it's, and they eat my lawn furniture and my irrigation system, and. I really don't like squirrels. Squirrels. So anyway, this is this next one's from Kenlo Santito. It says, "Hope I'm not too late." Uh, Forbidden World, 1982, and he says the last podcast didn't automatically download to Apple Podcasts for some reason. Hmm. Nick. <laughs> okay. Can I say this? I have no control over that. <laughs> it's. In Libsyn, the podcast host and distributor, and it's out there. I don't know what's going on. Hmm. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, then, never mind. I, I have <laughs> asked them, and they said it works fine. So I don't have many other ways, things that's I can true. do. Yeah, that's very true. Okay, this next is a uh, voicemail from Stan from Doylestown. Oh. Yeah, and let's see if I can get it to play. Hi, Mary, Nick, and the B-Movie family. Stan here from the creepy hills north of Doylestown, PA. Woo-hoo. Thought I'd check in with some thoughts about a prior podcast. Episode 473 of the cast, Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger, was great. A much better movie than I remembered once it was dissected by you guys. Guest Matt Niehoff really knew his stuff. Arnold did make his early fortune in real estate. Not many people would know that. Hmm. Arnold's career gave me an idea for a good B movie for the cast to consider. I'm not sure, but I don't think you've done it before. It's 1976's Stay Hungry with Arnold, Jeff Bridges, and Sally Fields. I'm going to get into some little known Arnold background here, but stick with me. I'll wrap it around to stay hungry. From the start, bodybuilding has always been a fringe sport and subculture. However, for about 25 years, starting in the very early 70s, it started to gain some acceptance from the mainstream of society. And two things were responsible. The first was the book Pumping Iron, The Art and Sport of Bodybuilding by Charles Gaines and photographer George Butler. The second was the dominance of the sport by Arnold. He won his first Mr. Olympia in 1970, the first of seven, and with the exception of a few other men in this sport, he was just way head and shoulders above everyone else who was competing. His dominance in competition was like Tiger Woods's in golf or Bobby Fischer's in chess. Anyway, the book Pumping Iron, published in 1972, explores the bodybuilding subculture of which Arnold was the king. So it's semi about him. Arnold made no secret about wanting to get into movies. So after the 1974 Mr. Olympia, he was seriously contemplating retiring. Along comes Charles Gaines, who had written a novel, Stay Hungry, which is being turned into a movie. It takes place in Birmingham, Alabama, and has a strong bodybuilding component to it. Arnold got the part as a fiddle-playing, philosophizing Mr. Universe hopeful, and believe it or not, won a Golden Globe for Best Debut in acting, although I think they did forget about Hercules in New York, which is definitely better with bourbon. Anyway, (laughs) it's really a Sally Fields and Jeff Bridges movie, and Nick, there's a naked Sally Fields in it, just saying. Actually, it's a sweet little forgotten gem that is better than its relative lack of notoriety gives it, and it has a lot of future stars and character actors in it, like Robert England, Scatman Crullers, Ed Begley Jr., R.G. Armstrong, who was in Race with the Devil. Yeah, great flick. Yeah. And Woodrow Palfrey, who was in everything, including Planet of the Apes. It's a surprisingly good mix of drama and comedy, and a good look back at mid-70s America. That's one of the best things about the B-movie cast. We get to look back at a time gone by in a country or region that isn't the same anymore. To me, that's fascinating. Anyway... 
Arnold lost about 25 pounds for the role because the director thought he dwarfed Sally Fields, who played his girlfriend. He went from around 245 to 225 pounds. Around the time the wow. film, the, around the time the filming was wrapping up, Arnold got word that they were going to be making pumping iron into a documentary film. So here's the sport taking off into the mainstream, and its legend and greatest hero is about to retire. Arnold trained like hell for the film and the Mr. Olympia, put the weight back on fast, and won the 75 Mr. Olympia in Pretoria, South Africa. Wow. Beating six foot five, 275 pound Lou Ferrigno in the process. After the contest, he announced his retirement. Initially, the documentary, as the producers saw it, would be about how the golden hero from sunny California had to take on the brooding, shadowy, up and coming colossus from New York. What the producers didn't know was the two personalities of the men were exact opposites. Lou Ferrigno's personality was that of a gentle giant from Brooklyn, and Arnold's is more shrewd, a, a do-what-I-have-to to win, even if it means playing mind games with you type of personality. To try to flip that and get them to act in the reverse was not going to work. After all, it was a documentary. Fast forward to 1980. This is where you might think I'm going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Arnold is filming Conan the Barbarian, once again slimmed down. The 80 Mr. Olympia held in Sydney, Australia, was approaching. Arnold got the same idea, but it wasn't 1975 anymore. There were younger guys who had achieved his level by then, and he was older. Bodybuilding is a very subjective sport, performance-enhancing drugs notwithstanding, and I think because it was Arnold, things went sideways in Sydney. I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but Arnold actually won his seventh Mr. Olympia in what was considered a very controversial result. Mm. You know what the big tell was? CBS Sports had sent an entire crew down to film the whole competition and then afterwards chose not to air it. That's a lot of wow. money. Okay, wow. no more Arnie. Love the Cabin of Dr. Caligar Caligari episode. That was really great. A truly beautifully shot movie. Very creepy and thought-provoking, like the movie M with Peter Lorre. From what I've read, German film industry was rivaling that of Hollywood at the time until the twin evils of world economic collapse and the rise of Hitler squashed it. Looking forward to Battle Beyond the Stars, episode 479. I think I'll listen to that next. Starring Sybil Danning, John Saxon, and John Boy? Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> so this is Stan from the Creepy Hills, north of Doylestown, signing off. Bye. Bye. Wow. That, that was, was great. awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Stan. I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, let's see. This next one is from Christopher Page. Uh, is that Forbidden World from 1982? Jim Wynorski at his sexiest best. I don't envy you, Mary. There are really only a few reasons why this film exists, and none of them resemble anything other than excuses for women to get naked. I think I watched it once and remember thinking that it is one of those films that if anyone walked in at any time while you're watching, you'd be embarrassed. Enjoy? And he says, oh, wait, you aren't watching that one. <laughs> Never mind, brain fart. <laughs> I love you, Christopher. Thank you for uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of awesome, man. <laughs> and congratulations on winning the Santita Surprise Prize. I want to hear what it is. You better get back with us on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and this next one is a voicemail by Dax Bradley. Oh, hey. Hello, B-Movie cast. Hi, Nick. One, distinguished guests. Hi, Mary. Hi, Dax. This is Dax in Eastern North Carolina. I hope that everybody out there is doing well, that you're all healthy, safe, and happy. And I'm happy because I just uh, finished listening to Battle Beyond the Stars. That episode was fantastic. Uh, I enjoyed the guest that you had, Alan Holtzman. Uh, like Mark Malston, he's kind of like the, uh, <laughs> uh, the James Bond of the movie world. He just brings all these experiences and great stories and interactions. I enjoy hearing about the trivia and the making of the films. That's really my wheelhouse. I'm looking forward to Alan's book when it comes out. But that episode was particularly good to me because Battle Beyond the Stars is one of my guilty pleasures uh, from when I was a kid and I equated that with Star Wars and Star Trek because I was a little idiot. But uh, <laughs> really it deserves more accolades 
than it gets because people often say, well, it's a, it's a Star Wars knockoff. No, uh, Star Crash was a Star Wars knockoff, but Battle Beyond the Stars is more based on Seven Samurai and The Magnificent Seven, yeah. you know, movies like that, which ironically, they inspired Star Wars. And so I think that uh, Battle Beyond the Stars is more original than people often say it is. I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed your episode on it. So, yeah, that's Yay. about it. You guys keep the great content flowing, and uh, I'll look forward to the next one next week. Take care. Dex, out. Bye, Dex. All right. Thanks, Dex. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate that. Um, our last bit of email is from Don Falcos. It said, um, that was... That was, for me, the most difficult difficult contest in a while. See, Nick? <clears throat> uh, fine. <laughs> fine, Mary. It's Everything's fine. <laughs> Although I have the movie in my collection, I've never actually watched it. Since, at first glance, the photo seemed to be to include a stormtrooper, if I hadn't figured out what it really was, I was planning to submit the answer, not Star Wars, <laughs> which, <laughs> which you must admit is correct. Yeah. That would that would be correct, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, not Star Wars. Okay. But alas, not good enough to earn a ping pong ball. Quite true. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Don, and thank you for actually guessing the correct answer so that's it for the uh the voicemails and um okay i had to change some stuff up because that last okay never mind uh, are I you hi mary what are we talking about <laughs> when i was playing that last voicemail there was a lot of background so i switched up the stuff on the mixer and i wanted to get it back for your voice so Oh, okay. I was busy and got distracted for, the for a minute. For the dulcet tones of my voice. Yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> dulcet. Dulcet. So that's it for today. All right. Well. Thank you for making me watch that movie. I really liked it. Okay. Thank Adrian. Yes, I didn't thank make Adrian. you watch it. Adrian made you watch thank it. You. And <laughs> uh, next podcast, I think we're going to do, what is it? The Battle Creek Brawl. Yeah. A.K.A. the Big Brawl yes. with Jackie Chan, mm -hmm. and uh, that one we're doing with co-host Mark Mostyn. Uh, no, 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 not Mark Mostyn. Michael Worth. Michael Worth. Yay. Michael Worth. Yay. He's, he's gonna come on for my birthday. That's my birthday yep. movie. Yep. So thank you, Michael, and yep. looking forward to that one. Looking way forward to it. Yeah, yeah. Always love a good martial arts flick. And the big brawl, a.k.a. the Battle Creek brawl, is a good martial arts flick. Cool. So there you go. Yay. Okay, well, I'll talk to you in about a week. since we. All right. Well, keep your nose in the wind and your tail to yourself, Mary. Oh, okay, <laughs> I will. I don't want to, but I will. <laughs> I That terrifies me. Bye, Mary. <laughs> Bye, Nick. Adios, Mafia. Well, they've gone. For good, Joe? No, just for now. It wasn't the right time for us to meet. But there'll be other nights, other stars for us to watch. They'll be back. <laughs> Their ghosts are moving tonight, restless, hungry. All right, fellas, here's your story. Greetings, my friend. We are all interested in the future, for that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. And we cannot keep this a secret any longer. Wait, Captain. I have found evidence of intelligent beings on this planet. Look to the skies. It's the Bee Movie Cookbook. Menus inspired by 15 of your favorite Bee Movies from the 1950s. With teenage werewolves, blobs, and enough cheese for everyone. When we return to our planet, the High Court may well sentence you to torture. But until then, we've got Ed Wood and Vincent Price. There'll be food and drink and ghosts. And perhaps even a few murders. You're all invited. So impress your friends with dinner and a movie. With the Bee Movie Cookbook, we've got you covered. Get your copy today at bmoviecookbook.com. That's bmoviecookbook.com. Let me see that book. 
I am interested to see what sways your mind so heavily. Sure thing, just visit bmoviecookbook.com. Anybody around here want some coffee? Transmission. The good guys always win, even in the 80s.